OTB's The Hurling Pod. With Board Gosh Energy. Hurling, it's anyone's game. Welcome along to The Hurling Pod at Hurling, it's anyone's game. Off the ball, teaming up with the Senior Hurling Championship sponsors, Board Gosh Energy. We're uncovering stories, highlighting the positive impact that hurling is having on people's lives. For full competition details, check out the website boardgoshenergy.ie forward slash home forward slash bge dash gaa plenty for us to talk about on the hurling pod this week including a cracker at porky Cueve, where cork fought back in the last 12 minutes to rescue a draw against tipperary it leaves munster wide open with each team now having completed two rounds of games over the first three weekends of the championship plenty of discussion coming out of this one about the fact that again it was a huge match a rivalry between cork and tipperary but not available on free to air tv that'll all be up for discussion here on the hurling pod we'll also be taking a look at the action in the leinster championship where dublin extended their very good record against wexford they've now got one foot in the all ireland series they've got a very strong chance of qualifying from the leinster championship following that victory at croke park no mercy shown by the leaders uh, both kilkenny and galway romping home to victories in their matches against westmead and antrim respectively Plenty to look forward to. Delighted to say I've got All-Ireland winners, James Skell and Paul Murphy alongside me. How are you getting on, lads? How's it going, mate? Good. All right. Well, Porky Cueve, uh, even if it was behind a paywall for people watching it, the great rivalry uh, was renewed at the weekend. We got a cracking game. We finished up Cork 419, Tipperary 225. Big finish to the game from the host Cork, who had a huge home crowd, over 30,000 people packed into Porky Cueve. Scored mm-hmm. 2-4 to tips 1-2 in the closing stages uh, to rescue a point. It leaves the Munster Championship scale uh, looking beautifully wide open after three rounds of games now. And it's probably anyone's call to see who's going to finish in the top three after this. Yeah, I, th- I think and obviously there's, 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 there's the marginal degree of separation amongst four teams in the minute, Walter being the outlier. Uh, and you could toss a coin. Like you could, we could have a conversation here and pick three teams. Go down the road to someone else and pick, pick three different teams. Just different teams. It's just it's the it's the nature of that championship at the minute, whereby you've got four teams, truthfully speaking, who are ultra competitive, uh, have huge quality, and you wouldn't begrudge them if they got out of the group. Um, like again, a great game, Parky Cueve. I, I, I just I like that venue now. I like I like that you know the, the atmosphere it creates. Like it's not the park we've old, obviously, but it just it, it seemed like a very a great ambiance. Like you'd love to be part of it as, as a player. Um, and I think the Cork players now are given, they're given something for the people to shout about. You know, so they're 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 showing up uh, and they're showing up consistently. So that was the question we asked, you know, over weeks previous and even years previous. You could say with Cork, is can they do a good performance, then back it up with another one? And like when the heat comes on, then can they can they stick to it? And they did. Like they went down, I think they went down five or six points on two or not three occasions on the match at the weekend. And they came back, you know, and albeit I know Tipperary lost Jason Ford, which is a big, big loss to have. But they had their own players too that stood up as well, you know, Tyne and Keogh, Norman Gregg in, magician. He just has that ability to be in pockets of space and you're wondering how did he get there? You know, it's just excellent Seamus Cannon back in again. So it was just, it was a, it was a good, I, I would call it a Titanic battle. And like when, when Tipperary sunk the, the second goal, um, I thought, Jesus, Corker. Cork went a bit of bother here. So went straight down the pitch again. Ran straight at the heart of Tipperary defence, which I know it was it was noted yesterday on the Sunday game. But I was just saying to you off here, the Tip have conceded four, seven goals now, excuse me. And I'd safely say you could say six of them have been, I won't say carbon copies, but they've been very, very repetitive. They've been ran at straight. So that's that's probably an issue that they're going to look at in, in-house and say this is not the this is not the an attribute of a of a Liam Cahill team. But look, great fixture, great game. Um Delighted we got, we we got to watch it because I you know GA goal and all that jazz <laughs> money well spent if you ask me. Yeah, let's talk, let's talk about that in a little bit. But the way the table yeah. sits then, so we've had uh, three weekends of games, so all the teams have now completed two fixtures at this point. Uh, Cork and Tipperary sit joint top three points each from the two games uh, would win the draw each. Uh, Clare and Limerick just behind them on two points each, and Waterford with no points as yet. But they are still in it by virtue of that draw. It still keeps their hopes alive. If they get to four points after their four games, potentially, they could still be in the mix to qualify. Murph, to pick up the point about Tipperary defensively, that's probably the one concern that Liam Callan's management team will have now, is that they've conceded a dozen goal chances in the first two matches. They've conceded seven goals. So for all the good work that they're doing further up the pitch, They've looked a little bit vulnerable in defence. Now, I don't know how much of that comes down to the rejigs. You've got players like Mike Breen going into a different position. You've got new players playing within that defence as well. 
or is it just a case of Tipperary looks susceptible defensively at the moment? What's your take on um, the way that they're leaking goals at the moment? Yeah, um, I think you summed it up fairly well there and that, you know, Liam Cal will be looking at this going and, and the backroom team basically saying that, again, so much good work being done around the pitch and, and Tipperary, particularly during this game against Cork, really took it to Cork and were aggressive. They were winning frees and they were, you know, you could see the fist pumping was going on and they were working really hard. And then to cough up for how hard they're working to maybe put three points on the board, to cough up a goal at the other end. It's just, it's such a sucker punch. And if you look at Declan Dalton's goal in particular, I mean, he picked up the ball outside the 45, ran in a straight line to goal and then batted it. Like, in those circumstances, you're saying a fella should at least be, you're coming out and you're, you're hitting oh, yeah. him or you're standing in front of him. You're not, like, going untouched a straight route from a 45 at goal. Like, that's criminal. You know, it's absolutely criminal. And considering the calibre and the size of men you have in, in that tip back line. So I think they'll be looking at that. Um, but it's a, it, it is a trait in... in uh, occasionally in temporary defences down the years where, I mean, we would have even seen it when we would have analysed them getting ready for them in certain games that at times, over the years, you know, it was something that they had to tighten up on. Like, we, when Limerick kind of first came onto the scene, we would have we would have noticed or noted that the likes of Kyle Hayes and these lads, when these big running forwards started coming in, there was opportunities there if you could run at them. But at the moment, considering how well they're hurling, how many things they're doing right, how clinical they are, all the good things that they're doing, um, you know, Lean Cal and them will be looking at it going like this is such a silly thing to be given away. Like, you know, up, the old the old adage of in Hurling, you know, give away a free if needs be. There's such a thing as giving away a good free. And people I know might be listening to this saying that's cynical, it's whatever. No, it's not. It's tactical, it's gamesmanship, you know, it's 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 match management. Just a case of going out there and so what if Patrick Horgan has to pop the ball over the bar, but it's criminal to let someone run through your defense and not lay a finger on them. Now I know at the same time Tip will be saying Robbie O'Flynn's one. Was it steps and so on? Uh, Mark, but yes. take. <laughs> hey, come here. Can I, can I just give you this info, right? So, Robbie yeah, O'Flynn right. ca- catches the ball on the 22 yard line, call it, right? Yeah. He puts the ball back into his hand. He strikes for the goal on the HR. He's on the HR line. He covered yeah. 14 yards <laughs> with, and no steps. <laughs> Does he I get away with that scale because of the fact that he takes two shoulders on the way through? I wonder if maybe that's the reason he doesn't get called for steps then. I'd say probably the referee looked at the tackles and probably, first of all, the challenges were minimal. Do you know what I mean? They, they weren't really frees, but I think it maybe, I'd use the word maybe fool the ref a touch, you know, and he let it off because it was like something was developing. Whereas if Robbie ran a straight line with no contact, he'd pull him. But I, I think you're right. But I think that the fact that he got, as you said, just a pinball between a couple of guys, it kind of, and they, whatever way they hit him, they set him on motion to go closer to the goals, you know? And I, I, I Morph is dead right. Yes, there was contact, contact, but there wasn't physical contact, if you know what I mean. Like, Robbie O'Flynn should be putting his hole there. <laughs> you know, but I'll do respect, like, you know, he should yeah. be put down. And same with Dalton. They, like, they, they can't get in un, untouched. So I presume, yeah. Skell, if you're a goalkeeper, you're having a right go at your defenders for letting them go through three of them. Yeah, I'm losing my life, to be honest. First of all, I hate conceding a goal. Mm-hmm. Second of all, then, if you concede a goal in that manner, that just drives you crazy. Because, like, like uh, you've got experienced players. And I, I appreciate, you know, Green is at full, you know, he's, he's at the backs, at full back this day and, other days, right? But like he's an experienced head, and so he knows long enough. Like, and they all know. And sure, same with Ronan Mahart. They're they're around long enough that they know this can't happen. Barrett, etc. So I, I can imagine Hogan had a few choice words with them. But like that's again, it's it's grand to learn a lesson now. But when you're in the Munster Championship, it could be a costly lesson because if Tip came away with two points there, they're in a super position. But conceding these goals in the manner in which they're conceding them, you know, is 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 huge food for thought for the management team. But the margins are so fine in Munster that we could look back at this fixture. In you know three weeks time, whenever it is, right, and say that draw has cost you. That could be able. You know that's that's just that's what we're talking about. You can probably get away with Leinster to be honest, but in Munster you won't. Yeah, like Murphy feels like a point dropped for Tipperary and probably a point earned for Cork with the way things worked out. First ten or eleven minutes, Cork were really good. I had two or three good goal chances, and then Tipperary wrestled control of the game. And I thought they were the better team from that maybe fifteen minute mark in the first half right through to about fifteen minutes to go. And they did enough good hurling to win the game in that period mm. and to have let a five-point lead slip when the game was in the balance. They'll be very, very disappointed that uh, they haven't come away with both points. Here. Yeah, they will. And I think there was a period, exactly as you're saying there, I think it was the 10th minute to the 30th minute where Tipperary outscored Cork. And I could be wrong here, but 10 points to one, I think it was. And that's, it was certainly during the 14th minute 
um, or the 15th minute up to the 30th minute, there yeah, was a score there. I remember they were really lost yeah. seven in a seven in a row. Right, there was a seven, score, but yeah. I think I think it could have reached as far as ten if you went back as far as the 10th minute. But either way, like we referred to earlier during the league, where Galway did that to Wexford in Wexford Park, and it was unacceptable even at that stage of the league. And again, actually, when Galway played Wexford again uh, during their own Robin phase, almost nearly happened again. And you know, you're highlighting it, saying you can't be doing that. So if we're saying that. Um, you know, Tipperary are going as we can't be giving away simple goals. Cork will be looking at this going, we are hurling really well and brilliant that we came back at Tipperary. But that period there, if we even brought that back to, okay, they outscored us by four points during it, well, that's fine. You call that a purple patch. But when it extends out to seven, eight or ten points, that's unacceptable. You can't be doing that. So if Tipperary are looking at their goals going, that's, we can't be giving away these goals. But Cork equally down the far end are going, we can't give teams a period where they dominate like that. Because if you look at it, like uh, like both teams there, and they're such exciting teams at the moment, both would be going, what what would scores would we be hitting here if we hurled for 60 minutes, 65 minutes without, you know, get rid of these mistakes that we're making? But I think for Cork particularly, and it's something to give Cork credit for as well, that they came back. I think some of the Cork teams over the last few years might have wilted against that Tipperary team at the weekend. But fair play to them that they came back. But the one thing I was thinking like that at the finish was... That stat was ringing in my head. That what if they didn't? What if they just racked up a few points during that period? They would have they would have won the game by a goal or four points, you know. Yeah. So uh, now I know that changes the attitude of the game. Also, you know, once Cork were down by six points, you know they had to respond. Um, but nevertheless, you know, both teams are coming away from this game going like there's so many positives we can take. We hurled really well in parts, but there is elephants in the room here that if we are in an All Ireland semi final and we're playing a Galway or a Limerick or a hopefully a Kenny or a Clare or something. And at that stage, if we're playing any of those teams, are they going to let us away with that? They're not, you know? So those are the things that 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 that, um, that both sides will be taking away. But like full credit to the likes of, you know, Shane Kingston, huge impact when he came on. Yeah. You know, I think three points involved in a great goal, you know. Um, you know, Alan Tynan was excellent <clears throat> for Tipperary, as we know, man in the match. Um, Declan Dalton stood up to a huge freeze. Like it was just there's so many positives there. Um, but definitely both teams still have things to work on. And you know what? It's no harm. It's no harm that you still have, you know, things to focus in on. Both teams going back to training are saying these are, you know, bullseyes that we have to hit now and get rid of these to really have a tilt at Munster. Mm-hmm. Skell, why is Shane Kingston not a starter for Cork? Because I'm sure he scored, I the same question. <laughs> it was a six points against Kilkenny last year, three points yeah. Yeah. off the bench just there gone by. And like mm-hmm. every time he comes on, he seems to be dangerous. Now, I don't know whether that's that he's a better impact player than a starter, but for all his talent, why isn't he a starter? Yeah, I, first of all, he's ferocious, ferociously talented. Uh, he's brilliant pace. He's, he's, he's physically in great condition, two-sided, loads of energy. So you'd say all, all that would lead to him being a starter. But he, he, we have seen him when he has started before, he hasn't had the impact. Mm. It's a bit like, I don't know, it's, I, I think of two, two things. Number one, Jim Gavin, he was the first guy really to introduce the terminology finishers. You remember with the Dublin subs? Um, so some, maybe some people you remember um, was it Kevin McManaman that was his name the full forward yeah, oh, he, was, yeah. He, yeah. Was, so he was the he, finisher yeah. so he, he always used, used to come in he always used to come in and next thing I'd say he got pigeonholed into this kind of role but it became vitally important for Dublin that when he came on he was like another there was there was going up, go up up the gears and he was going to finish in the game and he was always made a positive impact and the way Kingston's going at the minute I think you're looking at him going this, he, he probably has a similar impact you know and that Probably management, the management teams are looking at him going, if we can bring on a guy with this energy and this skill level at a stage of, let's say, 50 minutes in or whatever, right? And he can provide you with, you know, he was, he was involved in everything. He was involved in the Hayes goal. He was involved, you know, obviously got three points himself, let's say. He was tackling. He was doing an awful lot up in that mm-hmm. forward line, uh, right up to, the, up, to, up to match finish. So I think he's kind of, he's, he's there as well. He's, he's been put into that category. It's, it's the same thing you remember Alex Ferguson used to use Ali Gunnar Schultz for the same purpose, super so. You know, mm. I just think there's there's certain people in these roles, and I'd say Shane might hate to hear it himself. He wants to be starting and playing the whole game. However, he's been so um, good and had such a good impact coming on as a sub that he's kind of you know, have to consign himself to that role. I think, but you know, that's 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 my reason behind it. Anyway, I think I think I think it's logical. Or if we were watching the game and you were about to curse Dara Fitzgibbon at one point, he almost <laughs> did the Nani to Ronaldo moment where if you remember a few years ago, Ronaldo was about to yeah, score against yeah. Spain and Nani was standing on the line and he got called for offside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It looked initially as if Fitzgibbon was inside the square. And yeah. thankfully, from his point of view, he didn't steal a goal from Lahan there. 
Yeah, well, that was it. And and again, you have to give credit here, I suppose, to the umpires and the referee because they didn't get to look back on it. But by the time even watching on television, my eyes went from the ball <laughs> entering the square to where Fitzgibbon was. It looked like he was nearly on the goal line. It was like, there's no way this fella didn't or started outside the box. But uh, in fairness, because I think the ball was going in anyway, but in fairness to him, he was outside it. But I was saying, Jesus, that'd be some way to lose a goal if it happened to be... Like, how rare does that happen where a forward is nearly the only person in the box, the ball is going into the net and he hits it anyway, like, you know, but no, thankfully, I texted in, I had to withdraw it in fairness to Derek Fitzgibbon, I withdrew it in the WhatsApp, so... Uh, yeah, you always have these outlandish statements, don't you? <laughs> I tell you, well, I tell you, you were having a few points at the weekend, so if we screenshot your WhatsApp, then, sorry, you're, yeah. you, were like, you were like a social shotgun at the weekend, you were just, you were a man. I tell you, it could have been very saucy scale if we'd done a live pod this week. Yeah, it would have been um, it would have been eventful, I think. <laughs> but later, ending is the term you're looking for. <laughs> but you'd, you'd have loads of conf- content, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're looking for a sensation in the pod, you were going to get it. It's a, oh God, yeah. yeah! Thank God we didn't do it the live pod, or the, otherwise I got myself in trouble again. <laughs> Quite <laughs> weekend coming up next weekend. Maybe scale and points might well be the way through uh, an hour of yeah. chat there. Um, scale, when it comes to Tipperary, though, like losing Jason Ford. Um, it probably gets yeah. forgotten a little bit because obviously the game, there's so much drama after that. But he was having a really good start to the game and he goes down, he kind of feels the back of his hamstring. Liam Cal was saying afterwards, again, it's a precaution. They don't want to make it worse because Tip has got some big games, including that Limerick game coming up in the coming weeks. But um, it was a big blow to lose for it. Oh, cruel. Like he's, he's, you're talking about an all star caliber forward who was in really good form, was electric against Clare, making things happen. So you're looking at him to be one of your, your linchpins. He's, he's your guy that you're going to. Uh, Try and center your game around to a certain degree. He's your dead ball taker. So, like losing a guy of that caliber is cruel. But in fairness to Tipperary, they didn't skip a beat. Like, I, I, I know we, we talked about how they got clawed back and it was a draw and it felt like a point lost. I understand that. But they had players here, like, like again, O'Connor, did you get 1 3? 1 3. Yeah, I, think yeah, that one, yeah. I know there's a couple of frees, don't get me wrong. But look at the way he played. Kyo, we, we, you, you mentioned you mentioned Tynan, you know, just like super from, from players that wouldn't, I suppose, be called household names, to be fair, you know. Whereas Jason Ford is a household name. It seems like he's around forever. So I think taking him off as a precaution, logical decision, because in 20 days' time, let's say this Monster Championship is over, by the final, obviously, and we know exactly where we're at. So if if Jason kept on going, I say, theoretically, in that game and Tory's hamstring, that's a six-weeker. He's gone. His year is finished. You know, Tipperary could, Tipperary's year could be finished also. So it's just, that's, that's another, I suppose, I wouldn't call it an issue, but I suppose a test that you have when you're going through these round robins that if someone gets injured, there's no time to heal. You know, it's 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 dog it's dog eat dog, let's say. So that's why it's so it's so important to be to be medically fit. Um so look, hoping for his sake that we don't see like what 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 you see with Sean Finn a year in the injury. Because like we we as as neutrals, we want to see the best players showcase their skills and like look what they're producing like on, on Saturday. Savage. I wonder, Murph, when it came to Mark Keo putting the ball over the bar at a point when it looked like he was in on goal after the ball got stripped away. I wonder, does he hit that shot over the bar because he thinks he's about to be pulled back for a foul? Yeah, I don't know. It's, it, but either way, you kind of have to say, go for your goal. You know, e- either way, like if, if you're waiting for the referee to blow the whistle, like one of the things you say to even underage teams is, you know, don't be waiting for the referee to blow the whistle. Just play on, play the game and, and so on. But I don't see the difference of, was he waiting to be called? So I'll put it over the bar and then the referee will decide, oh, it's not a free because he put it over the bar. Like play for the goal and let the referee, yeah. make it the referee's decision, you know? Um, but it was, a, it was a strange one because by the time he realised the ball was coming out of his hand, he was nearly in the D at that stage, you know? Um, but it's a hard one in the moment as well. Like it is, it is a kind of a hard one that everything happened so quickly there. He probably just got the ball, saw that in fairness, it wasn't a blatant goal opportunity, but certainly if he worked the ball a small bit better, they could have got a goal, but I don't think waiting for the referee to see what he's going to do. Do I put it over the bar, stick it in the goal, go for goal if it's on, regardless, and don't be letting the referee's decision influence you. Yeah, yeah. I think at that point, Seamus Callanan was also over his shoulder, the far side. Mm. So if he'd wanted to eat a very easy pass across to a, a goal scorer to put the ball into the net, um, Skell, I actually thought that Noel McGrath was a little bit hard done by not getting player of the game because he was so good at putting ball into the forward line. He played some very clever disguise passes during the game. I can understand why Seamus Hickey on the coverage decided to go for Alan Tynan because yeah. four points from play is very eye-catching yeah. as well. But to me, it looked like Noel McGrath was pulling the strings all game. And, and, I, it, it, and you're right, because he was. It's as simple as that. I know he could be wearing eight or nine in his back, but he, sh- he, he pops up 
in all these positions and he's like he's orchestrating he's like he's like the puppet master you know he's moving the ball into passes like he's he's seeing passes in real time on the pitch that even people in tele, watching television might see themselves that that's that's reality like that he's kind of a well how would you equate this now even to a soccer situation he's like a, a paul scholes or a Pirlo, you know that kind of person who your game plan and the way like what you call it, me? I used to call these 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 split passes. That the kind of pass that is, that is is done that opens up, unlocks the whole the whole situation. And I think Noel is fully capable of that. And it's never a hundred yard pass. It's always a 15, 20 yarder, thirty yarder. The next thing, tip tip her in a in an open country. But like for him to keep going, I know I said after the Clare game as well, guys. For him to be at the age he is, I believe he's thirty four this year, which is not old by any means. Don't get me wrong. But you know how the game is so intense, it's so physical, it's so demanding on the body. Etc. For him to be as as crucial to tip, as influential to tip at that age is you know it, it's it's fabulous in fairness for, on, on his perspective. So it's a testament to him how he minds himself because he's 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 rarely injured. You don't see him you know carrying knocks mm-hmm. or or being unavailable to sort three. So look, he's been class. And again, if Tipperary really want to have a successful year, like an awful lot has to go through that man. They, they need they need him fired in big time because when they won in nineteen, was it? Did he get? 19, yeah. yeah. Was he player of the year? No, was he year? No, um, 19 was Callum. Did the shame you get played of the year, 19? Yeah, he did, yeah. yeah. But no got man the national final, is that right? Or I feel like, I feel like, I feel like my point, my point being is that when Tipperary won mm. that Ireland, like Norman mm. Brad was absolutely critical, so yeah. Um, Sean Flynn, who often does up the stats, uh, had Noel McGrath's stats up yesterday evening as well. So, um, uh, McGrath had possession 22 times during the game. He played seven deliveries that made an accurate pass to a forward inside Cork's half of the pitch. He also had 10 tackles during the game where he got four, four turnovers during it too. So um, incredible accuracy with his passes, but perhaps crucially, Murph, a lot of his passes got into dangerous scoring positions. And not just McGrath, but also really good diagonal passing from Tipperary from deeper positions. Their forwards get some really good balls sent into them. They do, yeah. And and there's I suppose just to pick up on two points there with... Um, with what James was saying and yourself like years ago I think when players got older like the thing was they go oh we'll stick him into the corner now but like I'd be completely against that because you go into the corner that's where you need someone with absolutely fresh legs with a heap of pace and like this thing of you know and players tip on you actually get more from them when they're in the half lines or midfield because they can coast onto balls and drift around and Noel McGrath is exceptional at that like years ago now when we would have played them let's say 2014 and back and we started to delve into possessions. He was always up really high in possessions, um, which was important for us to acknowledge because you could watch a game with Tipperary back in 2012, 13, 14, and they might go, Lara Corbett was exceptional today, Paddy Maher was exceptional. But when he did the possessions, here was Noel McGrath always in the top three, you know, and he was always there, always there, influencing the game. Now, and that's before, let's say, now at the moment, you know, back then, if someone got 18 possessions, it was huge because it was 50 50 balls that were being poked around. Now it's gone into the 20s in terms of because players are looking around, passing the ball. Now it's a bit more deliberate. So Noel McGrath can get on more balls. But what I think the real, I suppose, quality that he brings to that forward line is because he's so calm. If you think of Alan Tynan's point where it looked like they were bottled up on the far side of the pitch, as you were watching on telly, far side of the pitch in the first half, I think it was. He, he got the ball, had a little look around and just popped it out and landed in Talentine and put it over the bar. And there was a calmness there and an ability to see who's around half a second, there's my pass. Because he's able to do that and because the Tipperary players know that that calibre of players in their team, what you if you look at the rest of the pitch when he gets the ball, players will make runs even though he's not looking at them because they know if he takes turns around and has a half second, he'll deliver that ball. So like Liam Cal will be saying to his lads, lads, make the runs, make the runs, make the runs. And every manager in the country is telling their forwards, make them runs and give the defenders and the midfielders options to give the ball into. Yeah. But when you have a player like Noel McGrath who actually delivers quality ball every time he holds it and has this, I'll go back to like Skell was saying, a Paul Scholes type of get the head up and have a look around, automatically the forwards will run because they believe then that there's a player that's going to give them a ball into the hand and again, they can score. So it's, it's almost like a, a, another step on from just delivering good balls, the influence of uh, on the other players in the team because they know that he's pulling the strings. That's another layer that you can't really buy that and you can't, you know, you can't just tell a team to go out and hurl that way in the morning. You need to have a player that, that kind of builds or that has that confidence in the team and that the team know that He's capable of passing any sort of ball here, so it's just like it's it's it. I think if if we were to go into a transfer market at the moment, Noel McGrath is still up there in terms of players that that teams will go. 
we we could do with a bit of that in our team, you know. Oh, the, danger, the danger of bringing up the draft this Don't early podcast. You'll notice I did not say draft. I said transfer, transfer window because Skell is there now. It's like, remember Mr. T back in, uh, back in what was it, the A team? If you said a certain word, he'd go asleep. That was basically, it's like, sets you off. So if I said draft there now, Skell was just going to go. His off eyes and gla- glazed over tangent. Yeah, and Mr. T always says, I pity the fool. <laughs> 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 Either fool who eventually has to sit down and listen through this draft. I actually think we're going to do it today, but there's enough, I think, talking about it's coming out of the weekend. We push it to next week when there's just one game next week, and finally we will mm. execute this draft. Um, Thank you, because I'm formally re- requesting an extension of time. Good. Because <laughs> two or three people messaged, and I'm going to send the messages on to Skell. Um, it's amazing now I open the vast majority of my DMs on Twitter now are just basically hurling pod things. Where people go, I was listening to the pod during the week. Here's what you should do with the draft, is what the, ma- the vast majority of messages have been from the week just gone by. So yeah. I will share them, and Skell can do the pod next week. And Look at the monster great. we've created now. Yeah, <laughs> it's going, it, it can only be great. It could, couldn't possibly be a letdown after nearly three weeks of hype around it. Um, the thing as well about McGrath Skell is that that control was so important for Tipperary because there was a certain helter-skelter, particularly about the first half. And then Tipperary started to take control in midfield. Mm-hmm. And he was pretty crucial to that. He was, yeah. But, and, <clears throat> like it's, it's, so when, when, when Murph talked about you know, the, the gap that was created between Tip and Cork and the scoreline, like you can go back through those possessions and you can attribute that gap, not all of it, obviously, don't get me wrong, but being developed by, by McGrath to a certain degree. And like you're 100 right, Murph. If you if a guy who is 22 possessions, like you know, you'd say he's influencing the game in an attacking manner. But you just read the stats there, didn't you? You said 10 tackles. Yeah, like 10 tackles is fair tackling. Like, yeah, it's rugby, huge. Those rugby players they wouldn't have that in the game. You know, 10 tackles. Like, and for him, then tackling is one thing, but then he contributes to four turnovers. So like he's he's so he's doing a double job. So he's obviously he's lauded uh, nationally for for what he does on an attack perspective and the way he's able to control the game far too quickly. But look at the way he's now influencing the game for Tipperary when they don't have the ball. So, like, that's that's huge. That's huge for everyone else looking around too, to see how good he is going forward. Now, look how good he is going back to as well. So, that's that's the that's the standard. Like, you you need your big players to act first, you know. So, that's why I always look at the likes of, you know, TJ and Dahi Bork, these lads. They act first. They, they probably say very little, to be honest. And I imagine Norman Grad's probably the same way too. But, like, you, you, you the, the certain type of captains that lead and so other captains, you know, would speak, etc. But he's, he's a leader that, that does by action and, like, he's a great. A great ambassador for Tip, obviously, but he's a great, I'd say, influence the restaurant for the younger players. So, like, again, crucial to Tipperary's cause. Murph, how do we assess Tipperary then? Because that's the two away games navigated, three points picked up from them. They've got Limerick in a couple of weeks' time, and then they've got the last game at home against Waterford, too. Do you see them at this stage, and maybe they have to tighten things up at the back as being contenders for Munster and potentially even for the All Ireland further down the line? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, like you have to say, I suppose Munster at the moment. Yeah, um, the big thing for me and, and and what we've been saying every week about them is just their consistency. You no, know, they're very consistent. You know what they're going to get. Um, there's more teams out there playing with a bit more style and a bit more flair and all these things. But Tip know what they have. They know the players they have. They've really strengthened their bench. Uh, like a lot of lads have come to the fore now that weren't necessarily names previously, but now we're looking at them going, where did Liam Cal pull these lads out of? But I think Liam Cal just understands the players he's working with, where their best positions are, and how he sets up his team can maximise the potential of those players. And that's that's a brilliant thing to have. Um, and I think the Tipperary supporters at the moment are going like, this is, you know, we have something to grab onto here that we could go and win a monster. Um, and particularly how Munster is wide open at the moment. Like they'll be facing Limerick. And that'll be such an interesting game because what you're hitting there is at the moment people are looking at Limerick going, okay, what are we what's the response from Limerick now? And there could be a ferocious response from Limerick. There could be a response from Limerick whereby we still see maybe a bit of mental frailty at times. We don't know. We just don't know at the moment. Um, but what we do know with, with Tipperary is that they're going to come prepared. They seem to get really up for matches. Like there's not there doesn't seem to be any sort of a weakness in them where that the day is going to get to them. Whatever way Liam Cal is preparing them, they're riled up for games. They love a good challenge. So they're going to come ready for the likes of Limerick. And that'll be the big test. That'll be the really big test. And I think where as well in terms of if you go to the All-Ireland, that's nearly another conversation at the moment because to navigate, and like they're only two matches deep at this stage, to navigate Munster and win it, but then to step on into potentially facing a fresh Leinster team. Let's put it that way. Like, you know, you know that could that could ha- be its own challenge in itself. So I'd say where Tipperary are at the moment, absolutely contenders for Munster. 
and brilliant to be able to say that we have another team that, yeah, absolutely contender. And I'd say that with Cork as well. Tipperary are consistent at the moment. They're really building. They're playing with confidence. But the one thing you have to say is that if they, if a team unlocks them at the back, if the likes of Limerick or someone comes with something they're not ready for, that could be their undoing. So it's exciting to look at Tipperary at the moment, um, but still a few unknowns. But definitely, absolutely, if you were saying, are they contenders? Munster, yeah, all earned and absolutely, yeah. 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 Skell, I think when it, comes, when it comes to Cork, Skell, um, there's almost a similar feel to Tipperary here. So <clears> you got Pat Ryan coming in where he knows an awful lot of these players because he's worked with them previously at underage. Similarly with Cahill. So like when it comes to unearthing talent or in the case of Cork, it's um, been a case of maybe developing some of the talent that was already there mm-hmm. and getting some other lads in as options on the bench during the league. So he got to look at a wide array of players. Yeah. That's probably the biggest benefit the league was for Cork, wasn't it? The fact that now you look at the depth that they have within their panel. They've got two tough games to come in Munster. They have to go to Ennis next to play Clare and they're away to Limerick in the last round. Would there be a feeling that Cork have got options at least going into those two games? Yeah, and they've built strength and depth. I know I mentioned at the start of the year, uh, or started before the Munster Championship kicked off, that I was was backing, I was tipping Cork to come out with the group because I was saying the players that they have, they've got strength and depth, you know. And I think a couple of people questioned me, like, "Who, who would you... Class has been in strength and depth, but it's obvious now at the minute they've gone through two games, they've come out with three points, they're scoring, they're shooting the lights out, they're running, running hard. And I just think they've two things. Number one is they got a good tactical knowledge now at the minute. I think the management team will say obviously have a certain the principle of play, you could say, but tactically now they're they're defending better. No two ways about it. We picked up last year, remember after the league final when Cork were running through them for like like a, like a, a knife through butter. Whereas now you look at every situation that Tip were on the attack last day, <clears throat> heading for the goals, you see eight. Nine, ten red jerseys. You know that's pivot. Like if you if you look at any successful team, whenever they win a championship, defense always their defense is good. Always their defense is like is manic, is aggressive, is creating turnovers, is getting bodies back there. So for Cork to be able to, I suppose, showcase that in the last two games is a huge positive for me. So and again, you're, you're right. What you mean about Pat Ryan about his college, uh, call it local knowledge. You know, I always look at managers who take jobs in other counties and say, "She's they're they're probably off to a, you know." A bad start because they mightn't necessarily have the local knowledge of, of the youth having worked with under uh, B minors 20s etc and then they're trying to get find their feet in the first year while you know time has been wasted so whereas i think ryan same way with cahill they've got off to a good you know they, they know that they know the players they have they know the, the type of system they want to play so they're picking the pieces that they have to develop that system and i, I just I, I like what cork are doing and um, look I could sit here now and I could tell you in two, three weeks' time they might make it out of the group. That's possible, okay? Mm. And if they don't, so be it. We, we, know, we know the quality of Munster at the minute. But they are going places. And I, you can't tell me they're not. They are. They're going places in fairness. And so are Tipperary. Like Tipperary are already at the minute. They're 10 points. Their average scoring rate from, in comparison to 2022 to now is 10 points higher than what it was this time last year. I just did just, just, some there as a matter of interest. They're, they're 34 points. Like Some shooting. Whereas last year they're 24. So obviously they've taken a giant step forward. And like Cork the same way. So... Look, watch this space. It'll be interesting to see who gets out. Murph, this Munster Championship, it's the jewel in the GAA crown right now. We've seen packed grounds for all the matches so far. You've Liam Cowell saying after the game that he's rallying the Tipperary support to come out for the Limerick game. I saw John Fogarty, a journalist of the Irish Examiner, earlier today have pointed out at this stage for Semple Stadium on Sunday week, we're a full two weeks out from the game. It's only terrace tickets. The two stands are already sold out uh, for Limerick against Tipperary. And they've now got to a point where there's no stand seats left in Ennis for Clare against Cork on that day either. So down to terrace tickets in both cases. Um, So all the stand tickets, he says, are also sold for Limerick against Cork on May the 28th. We've been looking at packed grounds, uh, particularly a huge Cork crowd came out for that game uh, between Cork and Tipperary at the weekend. Like there's a phenomenal interest, understandably, in this championship because it's so competitive, because you've got the local rivalries. And right now, when you look at provincial finals that weren't that well attended in the football at the weekend, this is genuinely the jewel in the crown, isn't it? Oh, it is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can have all the good hurling you want, but we saw it during COVID when there's not a crowd, let's say on the extreme level of it, it it's it's a strange thing to watch. But when you bring it to the other end where you have a packed house and particularly likes of Turles, you know, like the, all these venues, some venues, it's very hard to put your finger on what makes it so magic with the atmosphere in, in, in the stadiums. We're, I think we were saying just before we came on as well, like that even Parky Cueve at the moment is, you know, it's a great job. It seems to be a really great atmosphere down there. Um, but it is, no, I think it was Jackie said it last night, Jewel in the Crown. It is at the moment. And it's great to hear that even this far out in provincial championships, that 
we have people fighting for tickets. Like it's exciting. We all know down through the years when there's a scramble for tickets, that's what you want. And you know you're getting into business end and that there's something on the line when there's a scramble for tickets and that there's only terrace left now two weeks out. Uh, like some lads going to have to suck up the pride. Some of the lads are usually used to sitting up in the stands, but, uh, but Mark, it's Turles brilliant. Is 40, Turles is 45,000 capacity. Oh, yeah. yeah. It is, uh, it's, yeah, I think it's 45. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, so, like, yeah. you're, talking about a, you're talking about a round robin game. Yeah, round robin game. <laughs> and we're heading for 40,000. <laughs> Do you yeah, know it's brilliant. It's absolutely yeah. brilliant. Like, it, you probably would have said at the start of this year, January 1st, if you're asking you, what game in Munster would draw that crowd, you're saying, well, the Munster final, because you're going to have, as it would have been then, okay, it's going to be Limerick versus X. And, you know, X's crowd will be the underdog and they'll follow. Here we are in the round robin phase, and it's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And like yeah. we were even joking in the WhatsApp scale, you were saying, Oh, yeah, sure, we'll all be going down and doing off the ball, <laughs> trying to sneak in the gate. Everybody's going to want to be at this, everybody's going to want to be at it. So it's, we won't yeah. be in the stand, unfortunately. Well, we might, we might get sideline, is it? The, yeah, side, <laughs> sideline, or maybe up a nice bird's, um, you know, bird's eye view. Mm-hmm. I really like the gantry in Thurless as well. I'm sure I can get us a box in there for the day. And and you put me up. I don't you know, you put me up. Do you know where the crane goes for the, for the high camera behind? It's the right place, yeah, right? You'd yeah. fire me yeah. up here, didn't you, won't you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that crane will tip over. The size of you, six foot five up in that joke. It'll tilt. You'll be I down know, I know I'm, You I can know, do it. Do you know what we're going to do? We'll actually get you up. You can do Hawkeye for the day. That's what we're going to do. Right? You narrate <laughs> narrate <laughs> Hawkeye. Heaven's wide, yeah. Heaven's wide. And, yeah, yeah. On, on puck out cam for the entire game as well. It brings around the point scale about GA go because this has been much debated over the last couple of days and people are very annoyed about you know some of the really big hurling games uh particularly I think Clare three of their first four games are going to be on GA go who have had Limerick against Clare and particularly Cork against Tipperary which are you know two huge fixtures it's pretty clear that when the GA were deciding the fixtures that they were going to put in the Saturday nights and were going to put behind the paywall they wanted two really good games to sell subscriptions early on yeah. They've got some big football games coming up in the All Ireland series, which they've just announced today as well. You know, putting teams like Kerry and Mayo and Galway on GA Go, they'll try and drive subscriptions in another way there. But to me, it seems really clear that while well, RT were taking a lot of the flack for the weekend just gone by, that the GA picked two or three big monster hurling games so that people would sign up early on. Yeah. Now, generally, I'm speaking kind of, I'm being a bit presumptuous here, right? I, I don't have the full ins and outs of how, what this deal is or whatever. So I, I, I find it hard to speak, you know, from an, from an informed position. But f- really, if what I see in front of me at the moment is obviously the GEA have, um, they've sold the platform. Okay, they've sold a number of games, right, for, for revenue generation. And that's fine. That's the landscape you see now in most modern sports nowadays. You have certain, whether it be channels like in soccer, you've got BT Sport, Premier Sports, etc. where there's going to be a, a finite number of games that, uh, that are going to be showcased behind the paywall. However, the big games, are never behind paywalls, you know. So, so like we're talking about the, the Clare and Limerick game. That wouldn't be behind a paywall if it was kind of teams of the same strength. You'd create them in a different sport. That'd be the free to air, I think, anyway. And like with Sky was in, Sky was probably started for seven or eight years ago. Would, would that be right, give or take, for the GA? Twenty thirteen or fourteen, yeah, yeah, more even. So yeah. So, but at the time, at least when you, if 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 you didn't have Sky and you didn't, you went and got Sky, you're basically buying a subscription, but you're getting a a whole host of other services, if you know what I mean. You're getting other sports, you're getting more channels, etc. So your value for money, if you, if you call it, was far higher. However, Sky never got the big, massive games. Sometimes both games were showcased in tandem. Sometimes RTE and Sky had the same games when you get down to, let's say, semi-final stage, etc. Whereas right now, they've just pigeonholed themselves into trying to, as you said yourself, drive nearly justification subscriptions by putting on the, the, the big games here. And like I... I'm starting to be a bit torn, to be honest, because I, I, I bought the subscription. Grant, I'm in a position to do so, but there's some people that aren't. You know, I was I was mentioning to you there, uh, I think it was last week, as I was saying about the neighbour trying to access the, you know, the Limerick Clear game. Couldn't do it because he didn't have the platform. Like he didn't have, you know, specific Wi-Fi, etc. So that's hard for them as an elderly as an elderly man, right? Whereas we can, but you're just you're ruling out a whole section of your audience and a whole section of your people. So that's right to issue it. I said to you, on one hand, I don't mind it because I understand, you know, it's, it's it's part and parcel of the modern game. And the modern, you know, revenue generation. On the other hand, I'm, I'm aggrieved for the normal five eighths of, of a fan who doesn't have a hundred channels on Sky, has only the, the, the national channels, and depends on that, you know, for the television. So, where where do we go? I, I'd like to see a mixture of both. I'd like to see a small bit of logic and, and teamed up thinking, whereby, yeah, let's give okay, GEO go. They have a certain amount of games, fair enough, right? But the big games, you have to put the big games on free to air. Like if I was a Galway person and Galway playing Kikini, right, and that game wasn't done. Jeez, I, I, wouldn't, you be, wouldn't you be cracked like if you, you didn't have access to it as, as your, main, your, your main team you know so 
look, there's, it's, there's food for thought. Um, I think they probably didn't do, do this as any justice. I understand the logic behind it. I just don't agree with it. That's all. I must admit, Murph, I was shocked that Don Logue made the comments on the Sunday game, which is the principal highlights program on the right holder uh, station on RTE. Again, I don't know whether those in RTE mightn't be too unhappy that actually he's putting a bit of pressure on about uh, the amount of fixtures that they have to show. And maybe this is food for talk for the GEA uh, when you've got such a prominent discussion and the fact that it went viral afterwards. But I was really, really surprised that actually he spoke so frankly and openly. Um, maybe this is a good thing because only last week that Joe Brawley was saying that everything has become too saccharine and boring uh, around punditry. And then Don Lowe gave both barrels last night. Yeah, but I think in, oh, it's... it's if, if you're to be, it'd be disingenuous if he said something different, you know, as in, I think it would have been worse for RT if they told him, listen, okay, say something, but, you know, wind your neck in here now. Don't be saying anything to do that. Because either don't address it or address it properly, but don't do some sort of a mealy mouthed kind of a, which he didn't do. You know, he was very, he was very honest. But I think in the interest of, look, in any walk of life, you have checks and balances and things in, in a way that, you know, you get constructive feedback and different things, and it might be come from an internal source. Like, let's say a team, put it into a GAA context. You know, teams, when they're preparing for matches, speak very honestly with each other. Afterwards, they're open to uh, criticism from their own fans, from their own backroom teams, and so on. If you look at this in the context of broadcast, Don Logue was just voicing his view of where he thinks it's at. And I think it's fair that the platform allowed him to do that. Like, he's not, he didn't go so far that he stepped over line with RTE. But I think if RTE were to be genuine about it, that's what's needed. Like, you need to have an open conversation. And if one of their pundits, who, in fairness, Don Logue down through the years hasn't gone completely off the wall. Like, I mean, Grant, he said he said a few things down that people would have taken exception to down over the years. But if they want to be honest and to be seen as being an, on, an honest broadcaster in terms of that they allow their pundits to come on, speak honestly, and there's your views, that's what you're here for. Well, that was the right thing to do. And I think fair play to him that they did do it. Now, again, we don't know, or I don't know whether that was agreed or disagreed or that, you know, Don Logue went rogue. But I don't think he did because, you know, it, like Jackie Hurley didn't didn't stop him from, yeah. you know, talking and, and they allowed Jackie expanded on it as well. So I think in fairness, it was probably a conscious decision by them to go, well, do you know what? Like, this is the elephant in the room at the moment. People are very passionate about this. Let's address it head on and let our pundits say what they need to say. And I think there's more there's more props to be given for doing that than for just either not doing it at all or, like I said, a mealy mouthed kind of a let's kind of talk about it, but let's not talk about it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought Jackie Hurley did a really good job on it. I mean, previously there have been some discussions on the Sunday game, and part of me was going, oh, that discussion has just been shut down when it was about to get interesting. Or it's a case of, ah, they're eating into the time where they could actually be showing the games, ironically enough. But yeah. last night, I thought that was a good discussion to have. And also the one about the uh, high tackles was a good discussion to have too. So I will want to put, put across you, like, didn't we, we noted this about the, so what, what the content of what they spoke with yesterday about the, you know, the, I suppose the expansion of the, the, the expansion of hurling, the advertising, etc. We noted this like weeks ago. So this is not like uh New news, you know what I mean. This is yeah. on; it's it's on the horizon. And I look, I know I'm I'm slightly concerned as well when you consider that we've got a we've got a football man coming in as a new GA president. You know, straight up, we have. Mm-hmm. And like, how, what, how high will Harlan be on his agenda? You know, like obviously, if you ask him the question in public, he'll give you a, a public answer. <laughs> what he thinks of it is the right answer. But I'm just wondering, let's say, I, how. Jackie said a great point yesterday. Jackie Shirley, when he's on about the Talton and Cup, is that what you're yeah. yeah, when he was saying that that was on television, and like it's only when he got me thinking, if would the Joe Madonna be, be on television in a mainstream game? No, it wouldn't, like you know, what I mean, it's mm. in, in comparison to others, I say. So, I'm saying, is there actual people in, in HQ that are prioritizing football over hurling? And I think the answer at the moment is probably yes, you know, mm. I hate to say it, so I'm slightly concerned about that. Yeah, I did a quick look down on how this broadcast deal works, so. RT for the next five years, unless it's renegotiated or maybe the terms are changed as part of the deal, I've got 31 matches which they're going to show per season. Now, you can have the debate, and maybe we can debate it down in a second, whether every provincial final needs to be shown free to air and that they should be sacrosanct as free to air. But that obviously means you've got uh, six provincial finals which are locked in. You've got the All-Ireland final, the semi-finals in both codes. They've committed as part of the Talton coming in. Maybe this is where the John McDonough missed the boat initially, is that they're committed to the two Talton Cup semi-finals and the final to be on free to air. The John McDonough Cup final is on free to air. 
two of the quarterfinals will be free to air and two will be on GA Go. So if you take that into account, that leaves them with a maximum of 11 picks between the Munster and Leinster Hurling Championships, all of the football provincials, and whatever they might want to show in this expanded football championship. So there's more and more games because we've gone back to the two provincial round robins in the hurling. There's more and more football games because now we've got a hugely expanded All-Ireland series. And yet there's the same amount of free-to-air games, Murph, as there was in the previous deal. So therefore, there's now just way too much to try and cover. And you end up with situations like this where one of the two sports is going to miss out. Like in a few weeks' time, football, I think, on the first week of the All-Ireland series, two of the games are on GA Go, and they're showing four hurling games that weekend. So you can be sure that the football community are going to have the same grievance that the hurling community are having right now that weekend. Yeah, yeah. And it is something that does have to be highlighted. And I, I think you had put it up on, on Twitter during the week. Just that, again, what something is getting lost in between is the amount of games that are now happening in the modern game. It's a huge, huge amount. But to counter that, you know, people are also talking about, and I think it was it was sent into our, our comments on Twitter or Instagram, just that people are saying, well, maybe now is the time if you're if you want to advance in your technology or your broadcasting, is there a chance now for a GA channel? Because also as well, like you have to understand, like this is RT1 and RT2 are not just for people who are involved in the GA or, or rugby or soccer. There's people who want to watch programs across the board, and that's a whole wider conversation. Mm. But if you were to literally cover all the big games over the weekend, there's nothing on only GA. And like I that's grand with me, that's fine. I have no issue with that whatsoever. But there's your argument then that, okay, how many games do we have? Well, maybe there's time for RTGA, if that's the case, that you have full GA um, across. And, and granted, you're going to have periods there where that channel is off air or shows reruns of games or whatever in the off season. But maybe maybe that's the route that the GA needs to be looking going down. And again, this is a conversation we probably all need to be having at the moment. Yeah. The thing is, Kel, there's a tremendous amount of hurling is still going to be shown at the top level between the Lee McCarthy and... Mm -hmm the end of the provincials but probably where hurling has really missed out is hurling further down the ladder because every week now ga go is picking its halton cup game of the week which they're going to show the semi-finals are on free to air the final is on free to air this was seen as a big selling point when the halton cup came in it was almost like we won't forget you in the same way that we forgot about the joe mcdonough teams who disappeared into the darkness uh, once we brought in graded competitions in the hurling surely there should be parity for the hurling teams who are in the second flight compared to the Tal um, well, f straight away, as, as a hurling person, as a hurling group, there should be. You know, obviously, and we again, we spoke previously. We're, we're passionate about the game. We're passionate about its growth. We want to, obviously it to be maintained in the in the call the traditional big counties, but we also want it to grow in the smaller counties uh, that don't have it as their premier sport. And I just don't think there's a there's a real want to do it. You know what I mean? I just I I, I would have always said it, um, regardless of what platform I'm speaking on, that I just don't think that the headquarters. Uh, want to grow the game as much as, as, as we might want, you know what I mean? And because you know what, it takes effort, it takes personnel, it takes finance, you know, it takes a long, a long time to try to grow a sport as difficult as hurling because you have to catch a jump. And then when you're going after the young, you're bringing in people to coaches, etc., whether it be through schools or clubs, that all takes a whole host of logistics that, that take money. And I just don't think they want they want to do it, to be honest. Like, I'd, I'd love to see, like, say, I'd love to see a world in 10 years' time where. Potentially, you could see, you know, a Mayo or a Sligo contesting back into a current championship. Now, I'm, I know I'm talking about dreamland stuff here now. Don't get me wrong, right? But like, if, if you you have to, you have to, you have to look go somewhere right, to get somewhere. Do you know what I mean? So like, if we're if we're talking about growing the hurling, we should be growing it in all all counties, trying to get everyone up to an even parity, which won't ever happen. But at least fucking try. Do you know what I mean? At least try get try get get a huge number of coaches in there. So that's first rant. <laughs> Second one, then in order to do so, you need to sh showcase the games. So I agree with everything, everything you're saying. They've prioritized the Tatlin Cup, I suppose, as a backlash. It's a bit like when you go into a county in a club championship and you try to limit the number of senior teams. Some teams just wanted to be called senior. Do you know what I mean? So I know when they, when they were selling the Tatlin Cup that they had to give, give a certain promotion to say, right, you're not in the Sam Maguire championship, you know, but you're going over here to this competition. So there were certain ways that to, to figure out. That's political. I get that, right? But from Horan's perspective, like, I'm, I'd be, I'd be sort of upset, angry that we don't get the same, what would you call it? Respect is that, is, that, is that a word? Is that, is that fair to say that the yeah. teams who participate yeah. in these championships don't get mm -hmm. the same the same respect, the same platform, you know, the same I don't know, even grounds, pitches of where these games are played, etc. So yeah, I just 
look, I, you're opening a big can of, of worms there to say, how do you actually fix this? Like, and you, you made a great point there about the, the congestion, the amount of games that are to be showcased. And like, well, if you, you're onto one, like with, with regards to the channel, I don't think it's an awful effort. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm up to stand correct there. Um, but like, I think didn't Dublin have a, have a TV channel at one stage? Yeah, they still do. They show their uh, championship yeah. games on Dubs TV. Yeah. So like, you know, it's so it's it's not beyond the realms of possibility to go in and just set set one up and say, you know, and make it free to you. But again, that's me sounding very, you know, very blasé about it, you know, as if it's, it's an easy task to do. But again, it's it's yeah, it's hard. Look, everything everything worth doing is is is, is tricky. If you know what I mean. So look, GA work to do. Yeah, and look, the thing as well, Murph, when it comes to it, as someone who's watched a good few of the Joe McDonough Cup games on streams. And I was watching Clubber's stream of Offaly against Kerry yesterday. It's great that they're available. A few years ago, Joe McDonough, there was no one there. You nearly yeah. would be relying on a Buff Egan Snapchat uh, to try and stay in tune with the game from a video perspective if you weren't there yourself. So this has improved. But at the same time, this actually makes it very... If people think that it's inaccessible right now, that you can't go on to GA Go and buy a subscription service or buy by game and watch that. If you're a Joe McDonough Cup fan, you've been dealing with this for a few years. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, as Skell was saying there, like this is the direct comparison to the Talton Cup or whatever. This is just our version of it. And these teams are the equivalent punching it in the same division, let's say, if, if, if you're to equate it across the two sports. Um, but yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, this is a drum that uh, Joe McDonough people and different counties have been banging down the years. And just to try and get a glimpse of their team um, on some sort of channel. And to be fair, like the TG Cahar and these have been really good uh, down through the years to cover games. And like we spoke about before coming on air, just that, you know, you could watch TG Cahar and you, you wouldn't know what game you're going to get, which is a great thing in that you've gone to GA Go or GAVO, that it's just such a wide variety of games. And TG Cahar can show that you can do it. You, know, you can get a camera to the game. And I don't think as well also that, it's a, it's a thing of that people want a big star-studded package necessarily. They just want to be able to see it. They don't even want necessarily crazy analysis. You know, a bit of commentary and a camera on it, and that's, that's more than enough. So, um, you know, although at times, we like some people may say that we're asking for a whole lot, in other ways, we're absolutely not because there's already the likes of TG Carr showing that it can be done. So I just think that, you know, there is a very valid argument here to say that, okay, you might want to watch you know, the Joe McDonough, but there's a lot of people that want to do it and, and the equivalent because they just want to see their team in action. Yeah. Um, the other thing on promotion, Conor O'Malley made a very good point on Twitter uh, earlier on today where he said promotion can't begin and end with TV coverage either. So a few people were picking up the point that Jackie had made about the fact that his young lads were, assess were obsessed with Liverpool. And then people are saying, well, look, Liverpool are behind the paywall all the time. You need a Sky subscription or you need BT if you're going to watch Liverpool in Europe or watch them in the Premier League. And the thing is that they're promoted in so many other different ways. So if you follow Liverpool on Twitter or on Instagram, there's a barrage of content to get you interested and to suck you in, whether that be their YouTube or anything else online. Yeah. The GA just don't do it in the same way. Um, young lads can get interested in teams by playing football manager or playing, I don't know, FIFA. Uh, well, the GA does not have that base. The GA is relying so much on uh, TV as opposed to what they do online. And I think they can definitely improve that offering. Um, they have improved it a bit. I mean, you can get highlights a lot quicker than you could before. I think the highlights that are put up by the GA themselves are much better than they were previously. Uh, but that's definitely a work in progress if you're going to get people uh, interested and involved in games. Uh, away from that scale, just want to ask you one about Limerick because this popped up in my timeline on Sunday. I was interested. So Barry Cleary had stuck this up. Um, Sheikh Barabbas. Interesting that despite <coughs> Limerick, quoting from his tweet here, how brilliant Limerick have been, seven of their last eight championship games have been one-score games. Are they actually closer to the pack than it felt? Their previous 10 games before that have been won by an average of 8.8 .8 points, with the only game that was a one-score game was the match against Galway <coughs> in 2020, which 20. was the All-Ireland semi-final. Mm -hmm. So, like, aside from that, he's making a very fair point that over the last eight championship games, while we were saluting Limerick for getting the job done and for winning the games and so on, maybe Limerick were actually a little bit closer than we thought they were to the pack. Yeah, like there's, there's, there's certainly, you know, there's definitely, he's, he's right in what he's saying. You know, if you're, if you're looking solely on just on the, the, the statistics, the, the numbers, et cetera, you would say all signs are pointing towards the, the, the pack are getting closer. I don't think it's a sign of Limerick regressing. I just think it's a sign of every other team progressing. You know, I just think like, like so if, you, if you rewind back two, three years ago, I certainly don't think Clare were anywhere near as strong as they are now. Um, Galway were, Kikini were, you know, Watford weren't, you know, Tip were going through a bit of a, a up, up and up and down from 20 onwards, you could say. So, like, 
I just think that the quality that the counties themselves are producing are are, 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 are closing the gap on Limerick. Because you know why? They've had to. Simple as that. Limerick have, have bet the choice of how people say in certain games over, you know, 20, 21, et cetera, that there's no choice. You either, you have to, to beat them, you have to surpass them. And like, if you have to surpass them, everything has to raise up. Standards, whether it be training, you know, of S&C, nutrition, you name it all. All those, all those miniature factors that go into producing a team on the pitch, like they just have to improve everything, you know. And I just think that teams have improved. And that's the way it is. Um, Maybe there's an argument that Limerick have regressed to touch. Maybe. Obviously, the signs have shown that they've lost their unbeaten record. Um, but again, if you're to ask me, are they the favourites to Ireland? Yes, they are. <laughs> they are. So, again, it's, if you're going to come at the king, you best, you best kill the king. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, because I know everyone's saying, oh, they're finished now after one game, after losing by a point to a team who, who performs well as clear. So, they're certainly not gone. Maybe they're coming back a bit. But I, I also think we'll, everyone, everyone's is catching up to them. Last team who were outside that three point differential and these games stretch across 22 and 23 seasons were Tipperary, who are Limerick's next opponents. So we'll see how they get on on Sunday week. Um, switching across to Leinster, then, Murph, we start with Crow Park on Saturday. This is a huge victory for Dublin. Uh, Wexford's issues with Dublin have continued. So uh, Dublin have only lost one of their last eight against Wexford, but we had real question marks about this game being moved to Crow Park and what impact that might have on <clears> Dublin. <throat> despite the fact that I thought some of the decisions uh, went against them in the second half, particularly when that game seemed to be in the balance and it looked like Wexford were going to claw back in and get a result uh, towards the end of the game. This is a match where Dublin were never behind and a match where Dublin held on for what's a huge victory and probably puts one foot into the All-Ireland series for them. Yeah, big victory. Um, and again, first I hold my hands up last week to say that I, I kind of favoured Wexford, but it it was really a coin toss here. We thought that Wexford maybe just had a bit more quality on the pitch that they might just be able to, you know, manage the game well enough to, to win this one without being too glamorous at any stage. You know, Dublin really helped by, again, Donald Burke just being absolutely exceptional. Um, and again, particularly even in how they just closed out the game with just such a long range free, like there was nothing in the game. And even Dublin's goal as well, you know, was a little bit of a kind of a sucker punch for Wexford. Like, you know, they weren't opened up. It wasn't anything like that. Um, just kind of one of those ones that falls into the net. But um, look again, fair play to Dublin because it, it is a big, it is a big scalp for them, is, if that's what you want to call it. But it's it's a big step forward, like you're saying. Uh, Wexford will be disappointed because this was the one that they were kind of going right. This would be the big two points for us. But look, there was a lot riding on this game, even though it may it wasn't going to set the world on fire, maybe in terms of quality, and and it didn't at times. Um, but Dublin won't care about that. They'll just be happy that. Look at, you know, we're in a kind of do or die situation here now. We went out and we won a really, really important game here. Um, again, their their bench, you know, had an impact like so Paul Crummy coming on there getting two points and things as well. So there is things that they can certainly point at and go, Yeah, well, look at we did what we had to do. Um, as a team, we'll be happy going forward. And and it's kind of a you know, if we can get as much as we can out of this year and by doing that, beating Wexford and, and putting one foot in a qualifier stage happy days so Dublin will be really happy with this but it's just I suppose it's another blow for Wexford in terms of coming off the league and you know I suppose trying to get things back up and going again and not having the year that they wanted so it's um, it, there was a lot riding in this game but Dublin will be really happy really really happy this weekend Skell your old manager Mial Dunhu be delighted he'll say look who cares it was 9,000 people in at Crow Park uh, on Saturday night it wasn't the biggest attendance for this game but ultimately Dublin have now had a run out at Crow Park and Maybe this was the right decision to play there. Yeah, well, obviously he's got a lot more access to the players than we than we do, and he knows exactly what he has. Um, I first hand, I, I questioned the decision to go to Crow Park because I know how difficult it has been uh, for all teams, whether it be golf, King, etc., to play in in Parnell Park, and they use that kind of nearly as a hunting ground. Um, so I thought when you when you take that away from from Dublin's armory, if you want to call it that, I said Geez, they're leaving open, they're leaving open, but like you know. They've went about their business. I know they got off to a rocky start, some, some would say, with, with Antrim, etc. But they probably look at this fixture. Um, so, like, for example, in Leinster, six teams, right? Galway will look at Kikini. Kikini will look at Galway. That's the fixture That's, that's the fixture we have to win. Dublin will look at Wexford. Wexford will look at Dublin, you know, etc. So, I think Wexford, you know, would have probably looked at this fixture and say, right, we'll take down Dublin at the start of the year. And now look where it's got them. Michal introducing the raft of new players. Murphy mentioned the boys that come in, doing really well. Do you change the goalie? Made a great save, Brennan. You know, at, at a key moment, poked out the ball fierce well, you know, and was in control of the game, if you ask me. Um, and they come away with a victory. Now, if you ask me, I guarantee he was he will say to you, they're expecting it. <laughs> you know, and that, that's that's what you want off a top level manager to win every game expecting to win. 
So they've come through, you know, as as we know, unbeaten, five points out of three games. They're not in a better position at all. Is. Like I know I from, from my position and probably from Paul as well, we're probably happier because we played each other. Mm. You know, and we, we we've remained unbeaten, you could say. But we we play Wexford for Kenny, we're happier that we haven't, you know, lost a game, etc. with Antrim and Dublin to come. So Dublin now have a couple of big games coming ahead of them and this will really test their metal, but they put themselves in a fantastic position because right now they're in the driving seat to get that I won't even say third place because we're all we're all on, on, on the one on the one level key now. So I think just I think whatever happens at the moment is a positive for Dublin if they can maintain the current trajectory. Because remember at the start of the year we were saying what does success for Dublin look like? And I think exiting the group, getting out of the group, you say, getting into an Ireland, Ireland uh, series is a huge success when you consider the turnover that Michael has had to endure with players. Like, can you imagine introducing Joe you know, McBride or Chris Crummy back into that team? Do you know what I mean? Or like, or, or even a rush type person, put them as back in that team where they where they go. So I think he's done a very very good job to get them as far as he's got them in such a little space of time. Yeah, uh, on Donald Burke, anyone is crazy at this stage, Murph, if they don't have him in their fancy team with the scoring that he's doing for Dublin. Um, but Mife was back in contact on Instagram earlier today and was wondering, would Donald Burke be a starter for teams maybe further up the ladder uh, than Dublin right now? And like, if you consider the amount of scoring that he, the scoring burden that's on him right now, because there's not a huge return coming off the inside forward line that Dublin have right now. Yeah. Burke is happy enough to drop back into the pockets, take shots, um, from distance and usually execute them really well. He's a very good free taker. He contributes from general play as well. Um, would Donald Burke get into a Limerick team or a Kilkenny or a Clare? Uh, he would definitely get into teams maybe up the, pe- the pecking order. To, like I suppose to say, would he get into the Limerick team is always a tough one because they're absolutely loaded in the, full, in the full forward, even midfield area because I see Donald Burke has been a player that could actually play in any midfield probably in the country because the way mid- midfield deploys now in, in how it plays he's very suitable for that you know because he, he does these great looping runs in terms of coming around picking up a ball he has great balance he's really good at striking from from the sidelines which you know uh, we've been critical about Dublin but nice. he is the man who is who is able to do that for them um, I don't think there's any team in the country would turn down having having a Donald Burke at their uh, disposal would he make the Limerick team at the moment? Ah, it's a very tough thing to say. Like, there's very few players. We we spoke about an All Ireland com- combined team there earlier, and we still said about eight of the Limerick lads still make that or nine of them. You know, so that's probably a different discussion. But like, you you even look at Kilkenny. You no, know, does Donald Burke come in there? You know, you'd, you'd have to say that if Donald Burke turned up in a Kilkenny jersey one day, he'd be in midfield or he'd, he'd find a place being forward because Kilkenny are cutting their cloth to measure as well. Like, you know, they're playing players that suit the game at the moment. Whereas if you look at uh, the likes of and, and Galway is similar, let's say, but if you look at the likes of Limerick, they're playing a kind of set 15, but every other team in the country is moving around their players. We were talking about Cork earlier, Shane Kingston sometimes starts, mostly comes off the bench. Again, depends on what you need. Donald Burke, I don't see why he wouldn't fit into any team in the country, let's say, <coughs> barring Limerick at the moment. Mm-hmm. Skell, would you have him for Galway? Or are you going to argue here that Evan Nyland does the exact same job? No, I, I think, well, Evan, I think. I wouldn't class them as similar. They're first, they're, they're, they're dead ball experts. We can establish that. Just Murph, when you were saying about his shooting sidelines, if you remember yesterday, uh, Dublin's 19th point, he got it like from a, just a, a stupid angle. Like he, he had the type of score you'd be, you'd be shouting at him not to shoot when he's going at it, you know? But like, yeah. there's there's certain players that have this in their locker. So we, we've often seen uh, Gillan and Flanagan shooting out over the shoulder when he wouldn't be, you know, from, from, a, from a solely... I suppose the percentage of chances, I say, the, 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 the probability is way down going over your shoulder. But certain players have this in their locker that once they try and execute the skill, you let them off. So I can I can well believe that Dorian Burke, when he's probably shooting like from ridiculous angles, does not have words said from him because he's he's pulling it off. Like answer to answer your question, when does he get in the goal team? He does, yeah. He gets in the goal team. He gets in the goal team in forward, not in replace seven though. And I won't say who to replace. <laughs> I, was, I was about I was about to say, is he coming for Connor Cooney or who's who's missing out here? I no, not talking. I'm saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Moving on. Right. Come on. <laughs> you you have a think about that. Shouting at people for shooting from poor angles. That's what the Wexford fans were doing in Crow Park. Because again, this becomes a familiar story. Nineteen wides during the game, Murph. Eleven mm. of them are in the second half when they're trying to chase Dublin down. Yeah, it's just not good enough if you're trying to win championship games. No, it's it's not, and it's it's, it's a sign of panic, really, and kind of maybe not like uh, players not to say players playing for themselves there that's not a case but it's players thinking individually as opposed to at the moment 
even club players at really good levels are programmed to go, is the shot on? If it's not on, I'm turning back around, I'm recycling, I'm looking for a player in a better position. And even if you fail in doing that, at least you've been shown to try and use the, the right uh, thinking process to go and get a score. But um, it, there, there's things that you can point out in teams that are symptomatic of a team that is maybe lacking a bit of confidence, is maybe lacking a bit of structure to what they're doing. Not to say that that structure isn't available to him, that Dara Egan isn't, isn't presented. Dara Egan seems to be, you know, when his teams are ticking, they're really good. It yeah. just seems to be symptomatic of a team that lacking a bit of confidence individually as players. And we've seen them look, I mean, again, player, they took a serious hammering. And you can guarantee all these kind of beatings would be residual, kind of, I suppose, hanging in the head. But when, when teams are shooting from mad angles, kind of, it's almost like you're reaching for something, hoping that one of them, two of them, three of them will land, and suddenly there's your spark and you find your spark. But it, it, any manager over a team would be telling their team, <clears throat> that's not your start point. Your start point isn't taking them shots. Your start point is getting the ball into really good shooting areas, let's say in around that 45, the big, like a larger D area, shooting from there. And then when you're kicking on and the confidence is up, if you feel that you're throwing the shackles off and, and that shot is on, we'll go for it. And, and they're rare shots. But when you're hanging everything on those shots, like it's, it's it's a sign of a team that is, I suppose, really, I suppose, backed into a corner that they don't really have a whole lot else on at the moment and that's the shots. But it's very frustrating. It kills confidence in teams. It deflates the backs. When the backs are looking up, maybe after working a really good ball out and the forwards are banging shots over from funny angles, not even over the bar, hitting them wide. It's, it's, it's a momentum killer in the team and it just completely kills confidence, not just for the fella that took it, for everybody else on the pitch as well. Yeah. Skell, when we were talking about Wexford being good for that 7-8 game spell <clears> that <throat> last year, so much of that came down to Conor McDonald being an ideal target man in the inside forward line and Rory O'Connor having the freedom in advanced positions to get into places where he could get scores and affect the game. Yeah. So now we're going to championship Conor McDonald's not starting. He came on about 10 minutes into the second half at Crow Park at the weekend. And Rory O'Connor, for the best part in recent games, has been playing in a more withdrawn role. Why is Conor McDonald not starting him? Why is Rory O'Connor not as close to goal as possible? Yeah, it's, it's hard to explain that one. Like, it's the only logical reason I can put behind it is maybe that Conor McDonald is somehow carrying a bit of a knock or has carried a bit of a knock and that he's been game managed. Because other than that, he can't be formed because you see, when he came in, he actually made an instant, instant impact. And like, he's the type of player that when he, when he played against Galway, like, he was a target man and he gave. He gave Garage Mack, you know, socks, which to be honest, because he's an orthodox left handers, high ball target, can shoot two sides. So you're saying he's all signs point to him being at the end of the square for, for, for Wexford. Um, so I can't draw any reason to it, only, only but injury, because otherwise, then, like, you're, you're taking one of your, one of your, you're, you're, he's your best forward, like, in, in terms of, well, I won't say best forward, I think, I think Rory's the best forward, in my opinion, right? But, but he's, he's your second best forward, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So why aren't you starting your second best forward? And all I can say is injury. Because I wonder now, would, will Dar Egan look at that game and say, geez, if I started him, would we have, you know, first of all, minimised the wides? We've got, got down from 19, get them into single figures, first of all. Could we have had a target man up there, etc.? All these questions are coming. Uh, and like if he starts the next game straight away, which I don't know, there's a week's grace or two weeks' grace, you know, it looks like a, a foolish move, let's be honest. Um, and I, I understand, like, say, we, there's a similar situation happening in Waterford with Ozzy Gleason, but what we're told then is that he's carrying a pretty significant knock and has missed a bit of time. So, Maybe you can understand to a certain degree there, but with Talent, there's been nothing that I know of. Now I'm open to correction here, but there's been nothing publicly said about him with injuries. So you know, it's hard. It's hard to to uh, to, to understand that the, the top boss is there. But look, I, I say it all the time about big big teams, and say I mentioned about Norman McGrath and Tipperary. If they're going to go places, if Wexford are going to go places, like you have to have Conor McDonald on the on the pitch. Like, and the, and the trouble is now, has the ship sailed? You know, they've been defeated by Galway, defeated by Dublin. You know, they can you come down the tracks? And it's like. You know what? Is, is it too little to wait at this stage? Should he even play on long? You know, yeah. tough questions to ask, but the answer should yeah. be. Soundings about the injuries seem to be that Liam Ryan is in a bit of bother, but obviously he's got the week off now. Dio O'Keefe, I think, was coming back uh, towards this game, so he should be okay for the Westmead game on Sunday week. And it's a case of getting those players fit and firing for the Kilkenny game. Like, they're far from out of it, Murph. This is a deflating defeat for them in terms of the campaign, but mm -hmm. Dublin still have to play Kilkenny and Galway. Wexford will point to their good record against Kilkenny previously, and they should be beating Westmead at Wexford Park this <clears> time. <throat> so it's far from done about qualification, but they are obviously on a backward foot after this defeat. Yeah, absolutely. And look, going from past experience, Wexford do get up for Kilkenny, and particularly in Wexford Park, like beating them in Nolan Park last year, like not a whole lot changes in the year in terms of teams. 
uh, even if they're down on their look at different times, are well capable of just pulling out this one performance that you know will will pull the rug from another team. And that could be Kilkenny's um, undoing if they don't approach the game properly, which not to say Kilkenny won't. I mean, I know we'll get on to Kilkenny and Antrim in a minute, but like Kilkenny approached Antrim, a potentially dangerous game up in Corrigan Park, which caused problems for Dublin. And they they cook, they quickly quelled any thought of, uh, you know, Antrim giving an upset. So I think Kilkenny will approach that in the same way. They'll look at Wexford and say, OK, these lads are a dangerous team. They have all the players uh, here that can potentially hurt us. But we do know that the confidence may not be or will not be where it should be with these lads. So let's get the doubt into their minds early and really go at them. And Kilkenny do have a bench to do it. But I'd agree with you. It's not foregone. And the likes of, you know, Kilkenny facing them will, will be going, lads, right, we're, let's face Dublin, let's do what we have to do. And when we go to Wexford, again, let's not, you know, turn this one into a banana skin whereby we should be winning it, but we don't because we take our eye off the ball. So it's, it's by no means a foregone conclusion. Um, but the idea that it's fully in Wexford's hands at the moment isn't the case, you know. Well, Paul, your former teammate, TJ Reid, is about to become the top scorer in championship history didn't quite get there at Corrigan Park scored just the 210 in uh, Kilkenny's win 531 to 320 against Antrim uh, but now at this stage Patrick Horgan is still out just in front 22 goals 532 so that's 598 he's definitely going to go over 600 Patrick Horgan but he doesn't play until after TJ Reid plays in the next game so TJ will get next shout and TJ Reid after that Antrim game has gone to 30 goals 506 that converts to 596 points. So TJ Reid hits three points. He becomes officially the championship top scorer of all time. We waited for so long uh, for this to happen, for Canning to get there, then for Hoagie to go ahead of him. And now it looks like TJ Reid is going to slip ahead of him. Um, it's still going to be a hell of an achievement for TJ Reid, even, even, even if it is a case of maybe him and Patrick Horgan taking the record from each other over the course of the next few weeks a few times. Ah, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, I suppose... We've we've said it several times that other sports, uh, I suppose, highlight these records far more than the GA highlight their own ones. But it's it's brilliant. I I wasn't actually aware that TJ was that close to Patrick Horgan. Again, did himself a huge uh, a huge favor by scoring two ten over the weekend. But yeah, it's it's a great little I suppose side story that the two of them, like two great players, that they're they're might I suppose overtake each other in a neck and neck race until one or either of them finish at some stage. But um. It's great achievement, you know, and, and it's huge scoring when you think of it, that both players are coming up on 600 points is, is remarkable scoring. Um, it, it bodes to, I suppose, ask the question that in a few years' time, given the amount of games at the moment, we'll probably see players finishing their career with 1,000 points, you know, because uh, Patrick Horgan and and uh, TJ played the majority of their careers where there was four matches a year, maybe five matches a year, you know. So um, it's, it's it's amazing to see where it is. But it's, look, it's great for both of them, either of them finishing up first or second for that period, you know, of their careers, it's a remarkable achievement and something both should definitely take pride in. But uh, I suppose we are just going to take it as a foregone conclusion that TJ managed to squeeze three points in the next game to to, to, to take a mantle for a small bit anyway. Scan. What have you scored in championship? How many have I scored? Yeah. I think I'm five. So I'm only 593 behind Patrick Horgan, which isn't right, bad friends. going now. I still have a bit of time. <laughs> have you scored in the football? Uh No. No, full back. Well, I know full backs go up and usually fist the ball over the bar and stuff, but I, that's not my style. No, it's too, too far to go. Hmm. Yeah, it's too far to go. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you have five points in in a in championship hurling. Not bad going for for a number the two. Right crack, I think you know well. You've got five points. Do you know the time they were taken? What side you hit them no, off? <laughs> no, I only I only remember one or two of them. I always remember the one I scored against Cork in. A, <laughs> I scored against Cork in 2013 in the quarter final, and like I think it was. Um, the Turtles. ball was poked out. Anthony Nash poked it out, yeah, and I came running onto it, popped it off. Larkin popped it back to me and I stuck it over. But I remember it was uh, Tommy or Henry or someone said it to me after and said, you did the right thing. Once you struck it, you ran away from it. So it looks even cooler then when it's going over the bar that you didn't stand looking at it. So I might have only scored a few, but I, I made the most of it when I did it. Wikipedia is claiming, Scale, that you didn't score any championship points. I don't I didn't know. No. I didn't. You had a few league frees, didn't you? That you were talking yeah. about before. Hmm. Did I score? No, I didn't score in championship. No. Here we are. Point that the goalkeeper didn't score in championship. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> As if, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, Murphy got a point the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> you love on Murphy, anyway. No, Mikey so Butler. Skell, it, yeah, he's no, he's no Mikey Butler, in fairness. Skell, if you had to pick between TJ and Horgan, 
who are you picking? I'd never make you pick between Canning and the two boys if we're going to take the top three, but who would you pick if you could only pick TJ or Patrick Organ? I have to go. I have to go with TJ. Hmm. Why? Like I, I, I some, sometimes I don't think uh, I'm going to shift my own point in a second here now. But sometimes I don't think <laughs> Horgan gets gets uh, doesn't get kind of the respect or recognition he deserves. Maybe because Cork haven't been successful, but like he's been a sharpshooter for an awful long time, hitting for six hundred points, savage. But TJ just I don't know. He just for me he just seems to do an awful lot more. He's a genius in the high ball. I still I still to this day I don't know how he does it. Um, you know he's been influential in all kind of six positions in the forwards. He's a guy that, you know, is still producing uh, top level performances at heading towards 35. Like I said, I know Horgan's too, but like TJ is just, I, I think he's he's considered, in my opinion, as a guy, man, as one of the all-time greats. If we're talking about the greats, obviously we can't, I can't talk about Christy Ring or the Rackers. I can talk about maybe the 1990 onwards, right? And mm. TJ is right up there, right up there. I think he's, he's in the same bracket, if you ask me, with, in my opinion, of Kenning, Shefflin, TJ, that's that's. I think they're a bracket by themselves. I don't. People would say, "What about Owen Kelly?" Savage as well, but I just think Canning, Chef, and TJ, those three up there, they're uh, they're on top of the mountain. If you ask me, Murphy, you ever heard the phrase "I'm about to shit in my own pint"? Ever? Before? <laughs> <laughs> no, I never. I, I'm not surprised though. He's just it's what I've come to expect from Scott. Yeah, it's a, new one. it's a new one for the pod. Um, and you'd be worried. You'd be worried if it didn't you know, say some of this. You say, "What's wrong with him? Is he sick?" Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, look, Kilkenny win in what's a complete score fest. Antrim will really wonder. Like he scored three twenty in a championship game, and you're still comprehensively beaten at home. Yeah. But Kilkenny scored five thirty one, and um, Mossy Hill a hat trick in the first half of the game. Uh, Kilkenny were in a very, very comfortable position. I guess at this stage, Murph, it gets to a point where Kilkenny and Galway, because of their draw against each other, can have no real uh, sympathy when they take on teams that they're expected to beat. No, no. Um, it, like, it was really pedestrian stuff, to be honest, Kilkenny and Antrim. Like, there wasn't uh, any great cut to it. I was thinking Antrim would come at this and take everything they possibly could from the game, but they just never really got into it. And look, I suppose not to be bad... Uh, Tantrum under goals, but they're, they're like okay. The first goal, really, really well put away, brilliant. The other two, if I could say, kind of came about through Kilkenny were fourteen points ahead, fifteen points ahead, and ball lands in, and you know maybe they'd switched off a small bit, and goal goes in, which they won't be happy with. But nevertheless, you felt that's where it was coming from. I mean, it didn't even create necessarily a kind of a is this a, going to be a spurt for Antrim in the game. Um, so many of the scores that Kenny got were just working the ball around really well, popping it over the bar and introduced quite a few subs. Um, even got Richie Hogan back on the pitch as well, you know. So like it, it was it was comfortable for Kenny for, for so much of it true. But um yeah, I'd agree. Like, I mean, Kenny will be looking at this going, we're drawing with Antrim, or if we draw with Galway, and Galway will look at it similar that you know, you don't want to leave these things down to score differences. Let's get out there and let's rack up a score and let's not hang around. And very much how Kilkenny approached it. Uh, and I, yeah, I'd agree with you. You can't, I suppose, have sympathy for teams in this. You just have to go out and score what you can score and control what you control. Yeah, like I don't mean to, to gloss over these game scale, but like they're just two almost non-contests. Uh, given that Galway went to Cusick Park on Saturday night and won 633 to 17 points. Conor Whelan got a hat trick in this one. Brian Concannon carried on his score and won three. Uh, 13 different scores across the game, which again is a positive for Galway. They seem to be sharing the scores around really, really well so far. But again, no mercy for Westmead coming from Galway here. No, and like Murphy is 100% correct. Like I say, when you, when you get a draw with, with, your, with your big rival in the group, you have no choice but to go and run up the score as much as you can. So like if, if, if either team, Galway or Kinney, came out with a result in, in that specific game, you know, you, you nearly say you can take the foot off the gas to a certain degree. But in this instance, you just can't. You just can't because even now, as of right now, the score difference, I'm I'm open to correction. Is only like a point or two between Galway and Kinney. Is that be right? I've got the table open somewhere here. Hold on. Uh, so Galway have, yeah, the one point between them. One point. Galway, Galway head and score difference by one point. So signs are on that say that both teams have to run up to score when they, when they meet, um, to be honest, inferior opposition. And like... Mm. The the Kikini Antrim game was and the Galway West Meath game. No, I didn't see the Galway West Meath game, right? But the Kikini Antrim game was, was was a tough watch. Like you know what I mean? It was just mm. there's, 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 there's a there's a skill level that Kikini are at the moment. That just Antrim, despite all the effort, hard work, volunteerism, you know, fitness, all that. Just the, the natural skill that Kikini have at the minute, you know, versus a team like Antrim. Same with Galway West Meath. It's just that's where the degree separation comes in. And like we have and so Kikini, we have numbers. 
you know, we have big numbers. Like if, if one of our guys goes down injured, like nine times out of ten, we can replace him. As much as we don't want to lose him, but we can replace him. Westmead Ranch and right now don't have that. They're not afford that luxury. It's just so, solely because they haven't got the number of clubs, number of players, and the numbers. So they're finding themselves in a, diff- a, a difficult position. And like it's, it was hard to listen to Joe Fortune after the game because you know he's they're trying their best, you know, and we appreciate it and respect it. But ultimately, as a goal person, to man, you have to just you know down them as much as you can because it's 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 dog eat dog. Look, look after number one as far as I'm concerned. So doesn't do them any good. Doesn't do goal team any good because I always think from them games you learn very little. All you do is get minutes into players that maybe you wouldn't have seen in the past, you know. Um, but that's that's as much as we can take from it, to be honest. Let's you know, take yeah. the two points, go home, thankful that nobody's injured, and uh, move on to the next. Like, we kind of have to address it, Murph, when both Westmead and Antrim are conceding on average 30 points a game so far, and Go and Kilkenny are scoring 30 points a game so far. Uh, the beating's obviously been handed out in both cases in the weekend just gone by. And like Dublin and Wexford kind of sit in the middle and are both competing to try and uh, get through with Kilkenny and Galway as things stand. But there's no way of getting away from it. There is clearly a gap between the bottom two teams and the top few in Leinster. And that's not a today or yesterday issue. It's not, no. Um, and OK, we've we've made strides to try and address it and spoke about that. OK, exposure of these teams to the higher level of teams um it's it's necessary and it's it's needed to see where they're at and to develop uh when you get it in the likes of a league format it's it's not as bad because the ball will be heavier the pitches are a bit heavier the scoreline doesn't get run up but you can see what happens over the weekend when the pitches dry up the ball is snappy teams can move the ball really fast that's when the game changes and like especially then when the teams can start stri- striking over points when there's no wind on a day uh, all these things feed into it. It's a different story then, and that's when teams get real uh, drubbins. Again, um, for Kilkenny and Galway, look, that's just, they can only play what's in front of them. That's just their lot. But going back to a conversation we would have had earlier this year on it, you know, it does point towards that. I know Munster is uh, is, is is a protected kind of a, a province in terms of we don't want to upset it, and it's not broken, so don't try and fix it. But if we want to have, I suppose... Kilkenny and Galway, as it is at the moment, as the two big teams going and really competing and having a tough year from the start, it does point towards open opening it out to a big group stage where you have Munster, Kilkenny and Galway. Wexford would like to think they're part of it and so would Dublin, and there's no reason why they couldn't be. They're not far away, but Westmead and Antrim are, are, are away from that. But that's that's where the indications would be, is that if Munster, for example, would be pointing at to say, well, Kilkenny and Galway are coming out very fresh and maybe that's unfair or whatever, well, then we have to open it up. And that's the only way at the moment because that would be a quicker solution to the problem than necessarily, I suppose, waiting for for Antrim and Westmead. And it goes back to another point that even Skettle was making earlier just about supporting it in that county or in those counties because they can only do so much to promote it in their own counties. They can only do so much financially and all these different things with volunteers. You know, if you really want to bring it up, you're going to have to absolutely pump money into these counties to bring them up. And, you know, they're not a million miles away. You know, a few structures over the course of 10 years could really bring on counties. Um, but it yeah. just it does it just seems like they're going to be out of reach for quite a while. That, and it's going to be find it hard where they're going to actually bridge that gap. Mm. But it has to go back into clubs more, don't, don't you think? Because like yeah. and to be honest, right, the counties and the schools don't do anything. Like what I see now with our, with our minors, right, all the clubs in Galway, is what's produced those herders. It's the clubs. So yeah. I've given money to county boards. Yes, Grant, putting a coach too. But we have to look, and it's going to take an awful effort. The money has to go into Westmead clubs, into Antrim clubs, these clubs, because they're the people who produce these herders and county players. And ultimately, mm-hmm. it's what we get to senior level. So I, but it has to be a grand plan. It has to be, not, not today or tomorrow, it's a 10 year, 15 year plan, mm-hmm. you know, for, 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 for the health and it has to save the game. Yeah, but if you look at like, I know people will point to Kilkenny and they'll say with football that let's say, oh, Kilkenny aren't playing senior level uh, football and, you know, they often obviously get bashed for that and different things. But if you look at primary schools in Kilkenny, 95% of primary schools in Kilkenny play Gaelic football. So players players aren't being left behind, like as in they are facilitated yeah. right up as far as under 15. And it's after under 15 that it kind of drops off and then comes back in. But let's say we played the C- or the club championship in terms of league with football was played in Kilkenny recently and we had 28 club teams playing. If you equate those numbers back to parts of Ulster, it's it, it, you can't bring those numbers together. Like it's in, you look for 28 juvenile club hurling teams in a county in Ulster. 
you know, you can't you can't equate those numbers. So if if people on a football inside are looking over the hedge at Kilkenny going, you know, you're not doing much to support it. Well, you're kind of saying, well, in a hurling point of view, what are you doing in your county to actually support the hurling? Because you know, teams at juvenile level where it it's that's where it started and finished. They have to go to other counties and do tournaments across counties to actually try and get some sort of traction where there's competition, where there's a, a pool of teams, there's a wide variety. So yeah. when you're when when you're looking at that, exactly, you do have to put money into it, but you have to support it and you have to allow these very, I suppose, isolated clubs in counties in and we'll speak about Ulster, but also let's say Mayo and Sligo and different places who really want to play it but aren't being facilitated. So like if you're if you're having if that's what I'd be saying, if you're having a conversation about Oh, you know, Kilkenny and football. Well, there's far bigger examples in the GA of where clubs and counties and hurling people are being disenfranchised because that support just isn't there. You know, and if we want to bring it up, that's there's your problem. You know. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I'm sure you're both welcoming awfully back to the All Ireland Senior Championship later this summer, um, playing Open for Christy Ring, Open 2021. Hands. I now here they are in the Lee McCarthy Championship in 2023. Uh, they're into the final with a round to go, unbeaten this year across league and championship. Already won Division 2A, so I'm going to enjoy my moment here. And now are into the McDonough Cup final, having beaten Kerry on Sunday afternoon. 124 to 16 points in the end. Very comprehensive win. Uh, definitely the biggest and perhaps most comfortable of the three wins they've had against Kerry this year. Owen Cal, two points short of his average for the year. He's been scoring 15 on average. 13 this time around. Uh, David Nally with a goal and a point, one of his trademark sidelines, well set up by Charlie Mitchell, the awfully under-20 captain for his goal. Uh, Shane Conway was doing most of the scoring for Kerry, uh, but they never really got back into the game after trailing at halftime. Conway scored uh, seven points from dead balls. So awfully qualify, and they're now kingmakers going into the last round of games. So Carlo are, I would think, the favourites to qualify for the final, which is coming up in a couple of Saturday's time at Crow Park. So Carlo beat down by 623 to 28 points. There's a score fest and a half. Marty Kavanagh with 111. Chris Nolan with 2-4. Uh, Pierce Oakman Cricket scored 10 points for down. Uh, puts Carlo into second place where they're a point above Leash and Kerry. They drew against both of those teams. So head-to-head is going to be less of a factor than scoring difference will be because of the way the fixtures have worked out. But if Carlo were to beat Offaly, who have nothing to play for in Dr. Cullen Park this coming Saturday, Carlo will go through to the final. If Offaly were to win, though, it opens the door for both Leash and Kerry, where the winners of that game would qualify if Carlo were to be beaten. And that's a straight shootout for both of these teams. Uh, Leash have found a bit of form. Maybe they will feel the late goal they conceded against Carlo is now going against them uh, because they trail into the final round of fixtures. But going to be a very interesting final day. So you've got Kerry against Leash and Tralee. You've got Carlo at home against Offaly. And the last game is a de facto relegation final where at the moment, Kildare hold the lead on scoring difference. The teams have both lost all their games. So down have to beat Kildare. A draw for Kildare at Hawkfield would be enough for them to stay in the Joe McDonough for the year coming. Uh, you were just saying before we come on air, James, it's remarkable that Kildare have gone from the point where they were in a Division 2A final, had had a wonderful campaign to get there, and the wheels have just come off since. So they've come right off, and you know, it's, it's, it's hard to find an explanation for it. And you'd have to ask the question, like, did they potentially uh, peak too early? You know, did, did they did they put all the eggs in one basket with the league, trying to get up into a, a higher division? Possibly. Maybe. Only, there's only, only one group of people know that, and that's the people who can do it themselves. But I was, like, four games, no no points, bad score difference. Like, they're not scoring either. Like, what, what did they get in their last game? Was this, 11 was it points easy? against Leash on Saturday afternoon. 123 to 11 they were beaten. Like, that's, that's not... <laughs> like, that, that won't win you anything, to be honest. That's what you expect to be scoring in... in in a poor first half, you know what I mean. Never mind in a whole game. So hard to hard to get to the, 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 the rules that problem as to how that happened. But I'd say there's a lot of learnings for Kildare going forward. And it's strange because they had an awful lot of um. It was like they had a lot, a lot of momentum built up, and it was like a, a real. It's a, a good story at, at the beginning of the year to see where they were going because we, as we just mentioned the last while, we want the other counties to get up into top tiers, but they just it just dropped off. There's no explanation for it. And now to find themselves where I guarantee they didn't expect to be in a relegation final. You, Theoretically speaking, uh, like that's probably tough to handle, tough to take for, for a group of players who were who were eyeing success in both competitions. So, look, they've uh, a bit of homework to do, I think. 
Yeah, it gives them that chance to rescue themselves on the final day. And they'll probably be happy enough to have scored 28 points against Carlo in that game in Ballycran. So it wasn't all negative for them going into the final round. And uh, they'll be hoping, again, they were scrapping at the bottom of Division 2A, where they would have been hoping to uh, fight for promotion, having been to the final last year. But uh, crucially important for both teams to try and stay up. So those fixtures at the weekend on Saturday, Clare against Down, Carlo versus Offaly, and Kerry versus Leash. All those games at half past five uh, this coming Saturday. Brings me around very nicely uh, to the questions that have come in, lads. And there's some good ones that have come in here. Uh, Evan O'Hearn, I'll give you this one first, Murph. Was it a mistake to start Robbie O'Flynn? Got the goal, but now has another injury. No. Uh, I, I would say in, this, in these circumstances, if there's a doubt over a person starting, don't bring him on because start, let's say you start James Gehill for Cork over the weekend, you bring on Robbie O'Flynn who has an injury, Robbie O'Flynn then his injury flares up and you take him off, you've now wasted the sub. Start him. And he had a great impact on the game. And then what did you do? You bring on Kingston, who is the ideal man to bring on, uh, and Cork kicked on. So it actually worked out quite, like, okay, relative terms, it worked out quite well for them. Obviously, it's not ideal for Robbie Flynn to pick up another injury. But if he's fit, you have to play him. Uh, again, we're speaking of with Wexford, Conor McDonald. Was he fit? Wasn't he fit? If if Pat Ryan is looking at Robbie Flynn going, is he fit or isn't he fit? If he is fit, you have to play him. He's in the top six in Cork, without doubt. Uh, and you saw what he brought to the table as well, which is great for a fellow coming back from injury as well, that, you know, he would go on at teams and so on and what grand, okay, he picked up an injury, but he has the, the bit between the teeth and he's going at teams. So it's brilliant. It's brilliant for them. But in, in any case, I think if for some reason you have a, a, an idea in the head to play a player and you think there might be an injury, well, you may start him because it's better to take a fella off after 30 minutes than bring him on after, and he could pull his hamstring after five minutes and you have to take him off and that's a sub wasted. Yeah. Uh, let's have a look here. This is a good one from John Hendrick, 96 scale. What would be considered a good year for Dublin? Um, I think we, that we we spoke about that a, a couple of months ago and we said if I don't think a Leinster final is realistic for Dublin. Um, maybe now if you ask them, they'll, they'll, they'll give you a different answer than that. I think for a successful year, if they come out of the group, enter into the All Ireland series, and if they compete well to get into, like, you know, we're talking about quarterfinals or whatnot. That's that's not bad. That's that's not bad for for especially for a new management and outside management, a turnover of players. So I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to say exit, get out, get out in third, uh, see can you win a, win a quarter final. And after that, then everything is a huge bonus. If you ask me, hmm. uh, Shane twenty two F. I'll answer this one. Are Tip conceding too many goals? Yes, and um, they're going to have to fix that <laughs> if they're uh, going to do well further down the track. Uh, <laughs> Connor McDonald seven. This one could be a few Murph. Who is Cork's best forward? Oh, well, sure, you have to say Declan Dalton, I suppose, at the moment. Um, just in terms of just in terms of the league he had, you know, he, he seemed quite potent, quite dangerous. He seems to be a confidence player as well. Um, you know, when he's when he kind of gets his back up, he he seems to be like, you know, he, he was popping over freeze there at the weekend, but I say popping over, he's striking from distance, but he got the crowd going. You know, he's a confidence player, and Cork, Cork, anytime they have that player in their forward line seem to start going. Like, you go back and you look at, like, the likes of Niall McCarthy. Declan Dalton kind of reminds me a bit like him. Like, there's a bit of divilment in him. There's a bit of a streak in him there, you know, where he builds on confidence. He gets the crowd going. He's a bit audacious at times and different things. But he gets the scores, you know. So, I would say at the moment, Declan Dalton. But, like, if you look at, like, if Lehan got traction and got form, he's a, he's a brilliant player. Seamus Harnady over the weekend, in fairness, started getting onto balls again. Harnady is a top-class player and um, is, without doubt, capable of being one of the best in the country probably is anyway like but capable of being in the top six in the country Horgan we know we know we get from Horgan maybe Horgan okay is 34 this year again you can't be expecting him forward um Robbie O'Flynn without injury probably Robbie O'Flynn but at the moment I'd have to say Declan Dalton is is the main man for Cork at the moment Skell who would you pick I hate to say I agree with Murphy I know. <laughs> Jesus, I was trying to think of. But sure, if the answer's right, Will, he has to agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I'm here no, to try I, and stir and get a bit of a debate going. Yeah, it goes back. I remember watching Dalton under twenty, um, or it was a twenty-one maybe even at the time. I can't remember, but he was impressive back then, and he's kind of a hybrid as well, goalkeeper and, and a forward. But then he's been in and out, get a couple of league games, never got much traction. Then I saw him in Salt Hill in the league game versus Galway, and I said, "Jesus, yeah, this is the real deal." So like, um, he's an influential player. Um, Great for Cork that, that we have a guy of, of that standing that's, that's able to run down 
the defence. Like on either wing, you consider Robbie Flynn on one side, Jack Donald on the other side, two lads, their goals are similar, if you know what I mean, in the way they, they attack them. So yeah, he's he's a he's a big player, big unit, and, and can move quick for his size. So he's important for Cork. And um Murphy's dead right, like in the sense that you big teams have these players to get behind, you know. So like everyone Limerick, they love Hagerty. Like I used to always say it about John Gardner for Cork. Um as an opposition, you hate him, but you'd love to have him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, simple yeah. as that. Like, you know, I hated Old Ol- Larkin. Like, heck, I hated him. <laughs> I hated him. The look of him, everything, right? Yeah. I'd love he's on my team. <laughs> I'd love he's yeah, in my yeah. team. Honestly. Was Larkin. Larkin. Yeah. I'd love he's in my team. And like, I think Dalton has potential to be that kind of person. You know, yeah. said, said divinment, which is a very yeah. nice way of putting it. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 But yeah. You know, there's a bit of a there's a bit of grunt in him, like so that's important for Cork going forward. Like when when the day comes where they have to mix it, you know, you need you need to like the Dalton to do to be there for you. So and yeah, even to be fair to him as well, if you look at the weekend, the last line ball, it was him that actually went fighting the Tipperary boys to try and turn that over. Uh, and he t- he came out with one or two balls inside his own 21 to, you know, chasing us down, getting a hook and a block. So it'd be one thing, as I'd say, you could name, you, you could look at a few forwards out there that they're finishers and they finish the, and all this. Yeah. But similar enough, I'll give it to you about Larkin. Like, you know, Larkin was a fellow who went back and would track lads and hound. It was his work rate he was there for as much as Anton. But I think, like, you know, you could look at Dalton at the weekend, and if Dalton just popped up at scores, you'd go, grand, okay, he's a forward out now, but what does he do when they don't have the ball? But he showed us over the weekend what he does when they don't have the ball, and he was really involved right up to the end, pushing Cork the whole way to get over the line. And that line ball at the end where it was him again that was there, I was like, I was looking at that going, that's a that's a fair trait in a player, and it's a sign of a player as well who's playing with a fair bit of belief. It's not just a kind of a, a little bit of a spurt he's going through, it's belief, yeah. it's, it's a bit of... The devilment to go on. I'm going to get stuck in here and get a belt on a few lads there as well. You know, I think I'd put it this way: Dalton, if he was put in the same position in a tip jersey for facing himself coming through in the goal, I think he would have went out and shouldered himself. You know what I mean? Like as in, he wouldn't allow a player to do that. So yeah. maybe something Cork have been lacking over the few years. We, we said it, and I think a few Cork lads came out and said, "Nice stick, man." But is there is there that cut to him? Dalton seems to have that cut to him. Mm. Well, Scal, that brings around nicely when you talk about you know players that you. You kind of didn't like on other teams that you would love to have had them. Uh, this one coming in from RN80. Who is the one hurling legend, not from your own county, that you would have loved to have played alongside? I uh, actually, a bit of a strange one. I'd love to have played beside Dan Shannon. Okay. <laughs> Why are you left, Murph? What's wrong with that? I just love, <laughs> I love, like you put loads of thought into stuff. And like Dan Shannon, hurler, former hurler of the year, I've met him a few times, fucking great fella. But I just, I love the two, the picture of the two E playing beside each other is very entertaining in my head. So go on. Yeah, if, right. if, if, if in doubt, just fire it down to Dan. Just fire it down to Dan. And when he starts grabbing the jersey, I grab my jersey back at him and then he'll see, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> a, virtual, yeah, yeah. a virtual fist pump. Uh, no, I, I, I like, I love watching him. Um, Obviously, he's, he's, he's a few years older than I am, obviously, but I loved watching him as a player for in, in that, that good water team. Remember the, the team of like 03, 04, mm. that, that, that mm. generation, that time? You know, he was yeah. he was classing him to get the opportunity to play against him. You know, speak to him. Lo- lovely, as, as you said, more lovely man. Uh, just like to play with him. I just think he, he would have been deadly on the pitch, as we know, and off the pitch, probably a bit of crack too. So, yeah. I'm going to go with him. <laughs> Who would you pick, Murph? Me. Uh, Me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, Owen Kelly, definitely. I would like to. Like, Owen Kelly is a stone's throw away from my club. Let's say Mullinhorn wouldn't be far from from Dane's Fort. Uh, he would have been school in Kieran's College as well. But like we played, we played um, Mullenhone last year in a challenge match and Owen Kelly was full forward, a corner forward or whatever. But I was saying to lads, I was like, lads, don't let him away. And like, you know, granted, Owen Kelly, I don't know, is he 39, 40 at this yeah. stage, not to be picking his age. But um, there was a few things like, you know, if there were short ones on, if there was crafty ones on, he was going for it. But at one stage, he broke his hurl. Now he broke it lengthways. So he had half a hurl, but it was the full length and uh, broke it, blocking it, and the ball popped up, and he got the ball, soloed it on the hurl as if he had a full boss, he had half a boss at this stage, soloed it, had a look around, and lads kind of stopped as if to say, well, he's hardly going to strike it, he has half a boss, struck a perfectly good 30-yard pass with half a boss, and lads were like, jeez, did you see him do that? I was like, that's, that's, like, that's Owen Kelly, like, he's in, in fairness, if they were picking a team at the Millennium tomorrow, he's in the conversation, like, you know, he's like, he's but it's just the thing, you don't lose that, like, you know, those players, no. another player as well, I'd say, is Ken McGrath, as a defender, like, uh, Ken McGrath was just one of these lads like I was lucky enough to play with Tommy like real inspirational type of player and Jackie like inspira- Like I don't think there was more inspirational player in his day than the likes of Ken McGrath so um, 
Um, but I like those players as well when I was playing with them. Like, I know Skell was saying before, the lad who you thought was bollocks or whatever, but those players, you know, I even admired them when I was playing with them or against them. Like, or I never played with them, but against them. Kelly was uh, Yeah. 91 8 Skell. I'll give you a first shout on this. Should the Leinster final be played in Port Leash or Tullamore this year to ensure there'd be a better atmosphere than Crow Park? Yeah, I was just saying to you a while ago, um, we played obviously Dublin in the minors there this day last week. Uh, in, in Tullamore, excuse me. And like everything about the venue is impressive, if you ask me. Like just the the route in, um, you can fit a nice, a nice, nice crowd. Uh, pitch is immaculate, dressing rooms are nice. So I and it'll, it'll facilitate both teams. So I think if if in the events that go, we can do square off. I think for the more is not a bad shot at all. Because looking at the game uh, with Dublin and Wexford, there was nine thousand, like just over ten percent of capacity of the stadium. And it looked like there was twenty people at it. Do you know what I mean? It provides no atmosphere for neither the crowd nor the players. Because I know players feed off the crowd. Like I. I there's certain games that still are vivid in my memory of having, you know, obviously Ireland finals and whatnot, but let's say lesser games um, where the crowd got, got active, got involved in the game, and it spurred the teams on to, to produce an even better spectacle. So that's hugely important because what happens is you hate to be a player to hear silence. You know, there's nothing nothing momentous about that. There's no sense of occasion or whatnot. So I think that's not a bad shout. Now, will it happen? Unlikely. <laughs> probably, probably unlikely, yeah. But I think it's a great shout. I think it's, it's definitely considered. And it, look, Anthem, Anthem to up, upgrade a spectacle should be done. Logical decision. But again, we're talking about the GA, so logic doesn't come into it every now and then. What do you reckon, Murph? No, I'd agree, yeah. Um, I think back to some of the matches that, look, call it spade, spade. We're not going to hit huge numbers for a Leinster final either way, it, but it'd be big numbers for uh, uh, provincial ground, you know, for, for a county ground. Um, if I think back as far as, like, Skell, when we played G in 2014, the two games up in Tullamore, Tullamore. like, what, what capacity is that, Will? Like, what's what's uh, Tullamore? I think at the time it was about 18,000. It's still yeah, around so about that area. I think we, we, we probably had about that. We probably had about 16, yeah. even if it was 14 or 15,000. Yeah. Those, the atmosphere of those games were, were, were brilliant. Were yeah. absolutely brilliant because you felt like the crowd was nearly in on top of you. Um, and that's kind of what you want. You know, if you want those small games, you go back and you think of when we played Tipperary in Kilkenny in 2013. I mean, again, you're talking 22,000 at that. Enormous, enormous atmosphere. But all those all those numbers get lost in Crow Park, unfortunately. Look, every player wants to play there. And if Crow Park is available, players will take your hand off. Absolutely. Um, but I wouldn't see Anton against it. I think you'd I think you'd be buying such an atmosphere if you went to uh right. if you went to a county ground. Or if do you remember in that game, I may have the order incorrect you now, but Shefflin got a pint under the stand off his left. Time was up, do you remember? Uh what which which year? 2014. Sorry, excuse me, in the in the drawn game and then Canning jumped mm. and got the equalizer. Yeah. Have I the order correct there? I have yeah, yeah, correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like that 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 kind of spectacle with with a with a, a, a nice size crowd in a tight spot, like like twenty more, let's say where it's seventy or eighteen thousand, that, that felt like there was eighty at it. Yeah. You know I mean? Yeah. You, you'd say it felt like there was eighty. And that's what that's the kind of like production you can get from from going to these type of grounds. So I think there's yeah, definitely food for thought there as well. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, to say as well, look, I mean, I know we're probably getting outside of the, the realms of it, but like bringing those numbers to a county ground, like bringing the fuck, the business, like to, is, is not um, to be sniffed at either. Like, you know, yeah. that you're bringing a big group of you know, 20,000 here or there. Like, that's not to be sniffed at either. Like, you know, again, which a number would be lost in Dublin. People wouldn't stay up and so on. But, you know, you might bring a bit of business to towns as well. I know we're probably stepping outside of our, our remit there, but not to be, not to be, I don't know, you know, I think. Ein cost living that. comes into it as well, lads. I mean, that mm. was talked about last year with the Galway Kilkenny crowd at the final, where very difficult accommodation in Dublin currently, and it's expensive to go up and down to the city. And that will be probably a conversation or a thought for some people. While if it was a case if they were going to Port Leash or they're going to Tullamore, it's very much a halfway final if it's Kilkenny against Galway. We'll see if Dublin gets the final. But either way, you know, it's e- probably easier to get in access wise, easier if you want to get accommodation and make a weekend out of it if you're going to one of those towns as well. So generally, I, th- I think there's a strong conversation to be had around it, but obviously Leinster Council have their agreements around Crow Park, so uh, mm-hmm. we might well be just speculating on something that can't happen. The very serious one that I wanted to bring up, Skell, and this was talked about in the Sunday game last night, because there's, <clears> there's been a series of head hits with tackles in recent weeks. We talked about Seamus Flanagan a few weeks ago. Um, obviously, there's a lot of discussion about Rona Marr. Uh, Keelan Kiley uh, took a very heavy hit in the Offaly against Kerry game yesterday, which removed his helmet as well. Do we get to a point where referees are going to have to be quite strict on these incidents? Because there's probably a duty of care to the players here from taking very heavy head blows. I think, yeah, there's, there's a couple of people that have to uh, have to take note. So first of all, I'd say the referees, yeah, 
And, and, and again, we always say it on this podcast, it's terribly difficult for the referees to make an in-game live decision for something that they might have actually missed. We have the benefit of replays. So putting all the focus or the onus on the referee to make the call that we get the chance to see five or six times, it's not quite fair. For me, the GEA have to seriously act. So retrospective bans, you know what I mean? In fairness, Flanagan should have been sent off for his seat on Bennett. You know, Ronan should have been sent off uh, on Saturday. And, you know, if you introduce retrospective bans and you actually stick with it, and you are, you know, across the board, it's, it's, it's a zero tolerance, you know, it's uh, it's going to catch on and players will catch that. Do you know what I mean? Like having played rugby, I can tell you, the onus is always on you. You're the one tackling, right? So the onus is, it's you, the, the tackler, okay? So if you make a bad hit, rugby has an absolute zero tolerance for anything going to do with the hit. Whether it be an elbow to the head, a tackle shoulder, you name it, right? You're getting a red card. And that's it, you're gone, right? Even if you try to peel it, you know, it's not going to get, you're not, you're not going to be successful because what they do is they say, rugby players, you know, they've obviously, there's no mitigation whatsoever, especially in hurling. So it has to happen as because I don't know, I've 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 had concussions, it's not nice. You're talking about you're talking about brain damage, you know what I mean? And if we're if we're introducing those words brain damage into our sport, you know, we need to eradicate them immediately. And like the, the biggest course of brain damage you can get in this sport is a head on shoulder hit that is uh, is not a good challenge at all. So everyone has to act as far as I'm concerned. Uh, players alike, there's no like don't get me wrong, I've done bad challenges myself, I've received bad challenges, however, the GA has to start. It needs to be a management directive down from the top where they retros- retrospectively ban these players because someday, hopefully, it never comes, but someday someone's going to get seriously hurt with these type of challenges, and that's what we don't want. Yeah, like Murph, when we were watching Cork and Tip, your first reaction was that there'd been a red card in the rugby for the tackle on Connor Murray, which put his head in danger, which was a straight red card. And obviously, rugby has moved in that direction. I don't, maybe hurling will start to go that direction too. Yeah, I think so. And it's just prioritizing players' health and, and the fact that the head is such an important, uh, I mean, it sounds like a stupid statement, but such an important area to protect. Um, and it was exactly that, like, you know, watching Munster in Glasgow at the weekend, uh, like that shoulder to Conor Murray's head wasn't even as blatant as what happened to Dara Fitzgibbon, you know, as in his neck was involved in that as well. Like, so if he didn't sustain a head injury, he could have sustained a serious neck injury. And it's not a case that you're looking out here to to cast out players as pariahs or anything. It's just to get it into players' heads that the onus is on you not to hit someone in the head. And then there may be mitigating factors, whereby, particularly in hurling, let's say if it's given us going on to raise the ball, didn't get it first time, it shouldn't be Fitzgibbon's fault though that he gets clattered then because he went for a second rise. It should be the onus is on the player coming in to tackle to say, and we all know it, if I'm running in a player, I'm thinking to him, am I going to stop before I get to him or am I going to hit him a shoulder because X, Y, and Z is in the equation here? Well, we need to get into the equation that players, if they're running at him, okay, well, I'm the player here with the momentum, I can cause injury here, and there's potential I'm going to get a red card if I, if I don't land my tackle properly. Well, now you're putting the thought in the player's head that, but you can't have any complaints, even if you didn't mean it. You can't have any complaints if you're after hitting a fella in the head, you roll the dice by going out and trying to shoulder a fella square on. He changed his body position, but you weren't in control of yourself and you hit him in the head because we will go down the route. Like we don't have respect for the head at the moment in, in Hurling. Um, and it's dangerous. It's dangerous to do it, uh, to, to go down that road. And all we're doing, it's just a ticking time bomb in terms of eventually it's become a conversation where we know what we know now all we have to do is look at rugby they respect that tackle and you see players in rugby getting red cards and not arguing now i know it's a culture in rugby where they don't argue but they don't argue because they know all right i was either deliberate or i went in with good intentions but i was reckless in how i did it and i'm getting a red card and i think if we bring that in then play the culture in hurling becomes yeah we're going to go in for fair tackles but only when i know i can do a fair tackle not, I can recklessly go in here and I know the referee is going to give me a yellow. Because what is, like, what's the, what's what gets a red card in hurling at the moment for a high tackle? Like, I mean, what's the precedence for it? I don't know what the precedence is. And I don't know, particularly at the game of the weekend, I didn't know what was going to get a yellow or a red or anything. So we're very loose in terms of what even we, we, we qualify anymore for a red card. I mean, for a high tackle, you know. Mm. Skell, as a former player, this isn't a case of us getting soft as hurling people, is it? Because um, that will be the accusation here, which will be people love to see big hits. People love to see you know lads going in to actually leave a mark on someone when they're going in for a tackle. There is a line between that and actual safety, isn't there? Well, there's there's, there's certainly a line. And like as a player, now again, I didn't have the opportunity too much as a, as a goalie. But you know when you're going into a tackle, right? Okay, I'm going to meet him on the shoulder here. You, you kind of know if he's running. It's 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 hard to explain. It's just kind of as long as the instinct is built into you. You know, okay, I, I have the potential to meet him on the shoulder. And you also know when you're going to meet him head on. 
Yeah. Guaranteed. You can't say as a player, oh, I didn't know. I didn't, you know it's not. The onus is on the player to control himself in such a manner that the tackle is safe. Now, the tackling can be hard. It can be arms out up front, you know what I mean? You can stop him, etc. But going in with the shoulder and heading into a, man, a man's chin, you know, or, or the side of his head, that's no, no. And every player knows this, like. And safety, and it's like, we're, we're not, um, we're not, I suppose, jeopardizing the the the, the, the physicality of the game. We're, like, we're not minimizing the, you know, the, the, the strengths for players to utilize. But it's just, it's all got to do with safety. It's as simple as that. And I, I don't think, I actually don't even think it's a topic for discussion. Do you know, no. it's, it's, do you know, what's the point of talking about it when we know, we know the, the, the actual aftermath of the events or of, of what a serious challenge can do or can be so dangerous. Just eradicate it. It's that, it's that simple. Like, just eradicate it. You know, so and I think the fact that we're talking about it is good and bad. It's bad that we have to talk about it, but it's good now that we're talking about it so it can get action in the future. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. I think um, there's some questions which I'm going to hold over uh, for next week because we've got one game. So why not keep some questions for next week? And the other thing is the suggestion which came in, Skell, to fix your draft issue, which would be, and this one came in from Pip, says, just regarding the draft picks, each team can only have a player selected from them once per round. So maximum you can lose is three players altogether. So this is a solution to, remember your idea that it could be a case of some of the top teams might get carved entirely over the first few rounds of the draft. Yeah. So across the draft, you can only lose three players altogether and you can only lose one player per draft. So each team can only select one player from another team, i.e. if Westmead pick Kyle Hayes in round one, they can't pick another Limerick player in rounds two or three. Would that help? Oh, that's, that's good, That's good. That's that's good. Lot, yeah. I think it's good. I, I think it, it, it puts a restriction on you, which isn't crazy, but also means you have to be a bit creative that... You're thinking ahead if you're like, say, Antrim or Westmead, who are going to have the first pick in the rounds to go, all right, well, if I am going to pick Galan here, if I am going to pick Lynch, that means he's the only Limerick player I can have. So now I have to have a think about maybe the Kilkenny, Galway, or Cork player that I'm going to pick in the next round. I think that's actually not a bad idea. This is actually hilarious. Like, look, look what we're talking about. I know. We're, yeah. a month, we're a month talking about this, right? And it's all yeah. my own fault. So I'm sorry, Liz. It's sorry. completely and like two two things like popped into my head there. Like like one was just like you're talking about this as if it's actually going to happen that you're going to ruin people's <laughs> lives. Like it's it's not happening, okay? And plus, yeah. well, if you did this draw like ten times, it'd be different ten times. So. Yeah. And the last thing I was thinking about then is like you're going to be here in absolute turmoil doing this. I'm probably going to just mute myself and eat a bowl of Weetabix or something like that and just intermittently shout abuse at you. So I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to it all around. I, I was laughing. You, you, you had a comment <laughs> while ago about RTE, how it's not just for people you know, watching GA, people of other programs. And I just got an image of you watching Room to Improve, ch chatting with the wife, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and me no, watching Ear to the Ground, something like that. Ear to the Ground, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I do you know what I'm actually watching what watch at the moment now? Um, actually, the final of Kim was on last night, which is very good, mm -hmm. very good. But uh, there's a great program on there about there's a lad sailing around Ireland. I can't think of his name now. War something Warner sailing around Ireland there doing the islands. Great program. Watch that now. It's on Sunday evenings. It's like meditation when you're watching. It. Goes what are you watching? While well, well, I, well, I check this. Warner sailing around Ireland. I can imagine you're a big David Attenborough man. I love all that. Yeah. yeah I can imagine that, right, yeah. What you're, you're saying that like as if it's a, a terrible thing, like yeah, the, looking I, at the Galapagos. That was your that was your interpretation, <laughs> my friend. <All> right. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Old Warner. Uh, to give credit to this show, it is called Ireland's Wild Islands. I'm telling you, watch that. It's absolutely brilliant. Now, concerning your Mr. Gogglebox here, Skell, what are you watching on TV? Uh, so I was the same as Murph. We watched Kim, um, and then I am a bit of a Netflix head, as I won't lie, but I, I actually love Succession. I'm, I'm through that at the minute. Yeah, that's that's that, mm. that is top drawer stuff. Like, um, what did I watch on Netflix recently? I we watched um, Night Agent, mm, poor enough. Then there was one, the, um, oh, not the fuck, your one. Watch it, actually. it was a good program. It's gone to me. <laughs> Diplomat. Very, help, very helpful. Jesus. <laughs> the Diplomat, yeah. yeah. Oh, fuck, yeah. watch your one. Oh, on Netflix. Yeah, I yeah. that yeah. program. Yeah. Diplomat, yeah, that was good, yeah. That was a good program. I, I, had, I had a brain freeze there for the moment. Sorry. You recovered well. Yeah, I'm on the succession buzz as well. And something else I watched, which is totally out of nowhere, wasn't feeling too well on Friday. I binged all of Instant Hotel in one go on Netflix, which is an Australian program from a few years ago. People may well have seen it. It just popped up on Netflix at the weekend and I watched it in one go. I always Would love you... a series where it's a reality show where people can shit on each other as part of the voting and so on. So it just oh. adds that extra bit of drama. So you go to, they obviously weren't allowed to call it Airbnb, which is what it is. So okay. they call it Instant Hotel. So what you have to do is you're four couples per round. 
you go to everyone else's house. And so they pick some, they pick all the cities across Australia. So it's something slightly different. Mm. You go and you judge them on four different categories and then they come and judge your house. But you also get judged as a person who has stayed at the hotel as well. And you can lose okay. points for being a bad guest. Interesting. Right. Would yeah, you just roll a dice on something? I will. Like if you just saw that something was there. A co- that was a complete roll of dice. It I was one of those three. You know where like you open Netflix and it was yeah. either new to Netflix or recommended on Netflix. You know where you've got that top bar? Yeah. I literally went, hmm, this looks interesting. Clicked it and watched. <laughs> and ended up watching about seven or eight episodes one after another. So that was my Friday evening. I actually have to, I have to put work into this. Like if I'm going to pick, yeah. no, pick a program, I have to wait for someone else to watch it. Then I ask them, and then I go look at it. Then I read reviews. I go way too fucking. It took me not just took me, three weeks, right, to, to decide to watch the pivot. <laughs> so realistically, you're actually probably a very good candidate for Gogglebox. Then that you had to just sit down and watch stuff that you mightn't have ever picked, which is actually oh, yeah. probably a good thing. Mm. Yeah, like, the guess thing of Gogglebox, right? On the first episode or two, I was you might might laugh this month. I was quite reserved, right? Well, one might even say refined, okay? It wasn't because because I, to be reserved, I, did I was afraid of, I was kind of nervous about what I, what I should say. Then, in like episode three or four, I said, like, fuck this, I can't hack this shit anymore. I have to say exactly what comes to my head. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, that got a fair reaction too. I, I remember I, I was living with Connor Bogarty at the time when we saw we turned on Gogglebox one day. We didn't know you were on it. And we didn't know you either, to be honest. Like, I didn't know you until we started doing this. But I remember coming on and going, is that James Skell on Gogglebox here? <laughs> And then we based everything we thought about you off your performance on Gogglebox then, whether you were an absolute gobshite or whether you were sound or whatever it was. And I'm 110%, haven't I? Won't say. <laughs> I'm not a gobshite anyway. Like. Ah, you're not, you're not, you're not. <laughs> I'm a yeah. Time, yeah. Well, gentlemen, oh, it's my pleasure. I'll let you back to whatever you want to watch this week. Uh, we're all going to be sitting down to watch Claire and Waterford this weekend, uh, perhaps more importantly, uh, the one game at the weekend for this week. Uh, thanks so many for everyone who has been watching on YouTube. We will go back to live, I think, in two weeks' time when we've got that weekend where all the hurling is on the TV, and that might be the ideal time to go back to a live format. Uh, so we'll be back with you next Monday for a view of that. Any of the questions we didn't get through to the Instagram, it was really busy today. We'll hold them over, um, some of them including uh, pick a combined team between the Great Kilkenny team and the current Limerick team. Um, I know, again, they're going to be huge fodder for Skell to try and get his notebook out. So I'll give him time to be ready for that one and we'll have Do a look at it. Or not? Hmm. See, there you go. Um, I said, uh, the funny thing is, I look back, right? And obviously, I got to know Murph last year with this pod. <laughs> I had Murph in my team of the decade from the 2010 2019 gone through. Fair play. You, you didn't make a Skell, unfortunately. Well, Murphy was in goals. <laughs> Hard to hard to <laughs> <laughs> um, if you no, enjoyed no, the yeah. pod and you've been watching along, uh, leave us a like, leave us a comment. Last week was was crazy. I think it's probably the most views we've ever had, somewhere in the fifteen thousand range on the YouTube. Over uh, two hundred likes on it as well. So we've been kind of growing episode and episode, both in terms of the audio pod and also the video. So if you can keep that going, that'd be great, lads. See you next week. Sound lads. See you, boys. OTB's The Hurling Pod. With Board Gosh Energy. Hurling. It's anyone's game.